Peter Shapiro presents I Want to Dance with Somebody, featuring Andy Frasco. Dance like everyone is watching. Every Saturday, get down with Andy for another round of costumes, grooves, smiles, and sweet tunes. Live dance-offs. Take your Saturday night dance party to the next level with a decked out dance floor. Every Saturday night, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. Dance together from home. I want to dance with somebody. Dance party featuring Andy Frasco. Only on fans.com.
So you want to watch the show and be in the stream at the same time? Here's how. You'll need two devices. It could be a computer, tablet, phone, or even a gaming system. One to watch the show and the other to be in the stream. Let's start with the show. Go to fans.com on your laptop, desktop, or mobile device. Scroll down and select a show you want to watch. Enter your info and boom, you're in the show. June 28th version. Uh, we got a really, really killer show today. We got a great guest. We have Amelia Davis joining us. Um, thank you again. It's Sunday. I know it's, uh, it's early for some of us on the West Coast. Um, we are going to talk today about the photography of Jim Marshall. Jim is one of the most legendary, legendary photographers in rock and roll uh, to ever walk the face of the earth. He is legendary in many, many, many ways. Um, and uh, his body of work is really, truly unmatched in terms of the output, the quantity, the quality, the access, all the things that, that all of us um, rock and roll photographers dream about um, uh, Jim had in spades. So a uh, couple of things real quick, the usual thank yous, Pete Shapiro, uh, Will, who's running the broadcast today, uh, Jonathan Healy, uh, Chris Batanti uh, for marketing, and Steph May, all the people, the Brooklyn Bulls, the Capitol Theater, Garcias. Um, thanks to everybody. Again, I want to mention Save Our Stages. There's a slide up here, saveourstages.com. Please check that out, and let's keep our small independent music uh, venues alive during the time of corona. Um, the next two shows that we have coming up, the next one after this is on July 12th. Uh, we won't be here for the 4th of July weekend because we'll all be watching the Fairly Well broadcast that Sunday, the 50th anniversary of the Grateful Dead here on fans.com. Uh, but on July 12th, I'm going to have some people on and we're going to talk about the photography of Neil Casal. And you guys all know that Neil was a musician who played with uh, the Chris Robinson Brotherhood and the hardworking Americans. And he played a lot with Phil Lesh and Bob Weir and O'Teal Burbridge and his band. And uh, he played with Ryan Adams and the Cardinals for many years. And uh, we lost Neil about 10 months ago. And just about uh, a little over a week ago, uh, they announced the Neil Casal Music Foundation, neilcasalmusicfoundation.org. And Neil was also a prolific photographer. And so we started a Kickstarter campaign. Just go to kickstarter.com and search Casal or go to neilcasalmusicfoundation.org and you can click into the Kickstarter campaign. And there's a coffee table book that we produced to raise money for this foundation. So that show is going to be on July 12th, and we're going to be showing Neil's photography. On July 19th, I'm going to be working with a guy named Jim Crowley. Jim's a San Francisco photographer, not a professional photographer, never wanted to be a professional photographer. He is a professional rock and roll fan. He has pictures of Jim Marshall and him uh, that he's taken that he showed me. And he just snuck his camera into shows, and he started shooting in the 70s and still shoots today as a hobby and just has a crazy story. So we're gonna do that on July 19th. Uh, Jim Marshall, getting back to Jim for a second here, uh, actually for the rest of the time. Uh, Jim and I were dear friends. Uh, Jim was a real true mentor to every young photographer, especially if you wanted to be a rock photographer. I have a lot of photographs of Jim's hanging on my wall in my office because Jim was like, yeah, Blakesburg, I'll trade you here. I'll give you two Bob Dylans for one Keith Richards, you know, like, I mean, I have 20 photos of Jim's that he gave me when he was alive. He was an incredibly generous human being, like beyond anything that you can imagine. Um, Jim was such a generous person that uh, a dear friend of his passed away about six months, I think, before Jim passed away. And um, he was also a photographer, a guy named Barry Shapiro. And Jim came to me and said, Blakesburg, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to make a book of Barry Shapiro's photography. I went and looked at Barry's photography with Jim at a gallery. It was incredible. And Jim said, here, and wrote me a check for $10,000 on the spot and said, make sure this book gets published. And, uh, and then Jim wrote me that check and died two weeks after he wrote that check. So his last grand gesture in life was to make sure a book was made of one of his dear friends, photograph uh, of that guy's photographic archive. It's an incredible book. And J that's, that's Jim. Jim was the most generous human being you could ever imagine. 
and after Jim passed away 10 years ago, Amelia, are we at 10 years ago? Yeah, we're right at now? 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So uh, after Jim passed away, um, everything was left to Amelia Davis, our guest today. Amelia was Jim's uh, dear friend, his assistant, his uh, listening board, his sounding board, uh, maybe his punching bag at times. <laughs> um, his surrogate mother. <laughs> surrogate mother. Um, and, uh, and Amelia's partner, Benita, was part of that equation. And uh, Jim had no family, had no kids. He had no nieces, no nephews. And he left his entire archive in the care of Amelia Davis. And there couldn't be a better person out there to take care of this body of work because she heard all of the stories about these photographs from Jim, from the mouth of Jim. She knew so much about these photographs because they would sit around and he would tell her these stories about working with everybody from Christofferson to Monk, and these are the pictures that are behind her right now, to Muddy Waters, to Janice and Grace, to the Grateful Dead, to Johnny Cash, to Bob Dylan, the Rolling Stones, and everybody in between. And so Amelia has, over the last 10 years, brought Jim's work to the forefront of, of contemporary photography and how important it is on a museum level, as well as protecting it like they are her children, because these were Jim's children as well. Jim referred to his photographs as his children. And, and, I, and full disclosure here, uh, about six months after Jim passed away, Amelia came to me and asked if I would help out her in helping manage Jim's estate. And what I do for Amelia is I do all the digital production here at my studio. So we do all the digital scanning of Jim's work at the highest quality that we could possibly do it at. And then I do all the licensing. So if somebody on a TV, television show or a documentary or a book or a magazine wants to use one of Jim's photographs, that request comes to me and me and Amelia and her partner Benita discuss the terms and what we will allow and what we won't allow. Because what's so important in today's world with this stuff is to protect the rights of the creator of these photographs. And we spend an enormous amount of time, Amelia and myself, um, uh, reading and rewriting contracts and protecting Jim's work so that there's no confusion as to how these photos can be used under what circumstances and for how long. And we're very, very particular about that. And so that's what I do with the estate. And so I've been very, very fortunate because I've been a fan of Jim Marshall's photography since I was a teenager. Jim inspired me to do what I do, be a music photographer. His were the first photos of the Grateful Dead that I ever saw. We're going to look at some of these today. When I opened up the album cover to Live Dead and there's Jim Marshall's photos. And I'd open up Relics Magazine or Rolling Stone Magazine and I would see Jim's photography. That's what inspired me. And so when I finally got to meet Jim when I moved to San Francisco and he sort of took me under his wing in a little way, I wanted to give back as well to Jim because he was such an important figure to me and his work was so important. And when I was asked to do this with Amelia and, and one of the first things that we did was start to scan his archive, I got to see so much incredible photography. So... We have a, a, a film, actually, we have a trailer for the new Jim Marshall documentary that Amelia and Benita, her partner, uh, uh, produced. And um, let's take a look at that trailer. And then I'm going to come back and Amelia is going to talk a little bit about the film. And then we're going to jump into our, our um, uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, showing all these different photographs and all these different people that Jim worked with over the years. So let's take a, a couple of minutes and let's watch this short little trailer and you get a little taste of, of what Jim was all about. And then we'll be back with Amelia in a minute. All right, go for it. Fuck all the words, man. Look at my work. Look at my track record over 20 years of taking pictures. Look at my body of work. Think it works? Jim Marshall. Who's Jim Marshall? Where do you start? Jim was the man. Jim was nuts. He was like a rock star. My father had an abrasive exterior, but had a great big warm heart underneath it. Jim Marshall was exactly the same way. You do not want to be on the wrong side of Jim Marshall. I'd always like cars, guns, and cameras. Cars and guns have got me in trouble. Cameras haven't. <laughs> Marshall started out shooting sight guys of the 60s at the height of the beatnik era. 
John Coltrane asked me, how do you get to Berkeley? And so I said, I'll drive you. And I shot pictures at the interview. And they're beautiful. He captured the serenity of the guy and the depth and the intensity. Miles, he goes, why don't you ever take pictures of me like that? I go, why don't you let me? He's so important to an era where a lot was changing socially, artistically. They had to respect him to let them that close. The Hendrix pictures from the sound check. Jim is standing face to face with this guy. Those photos are indelible. His pictures are a personification of the incredible depth of feeling that musicians had. An artist lets you into their life and I feel to violate that trust is criminal. Doing sound check, I said, Johnny, let's do a shot for the warden. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> Jim pushed every boundary. It was rock and roll, man. The 72 tour, I probably did more coke than they did. <laughs> the stuff that Jim got, you'll never see that again. I couldn't ask for a better life. It was nuts. <laughs>
right? So when people started writing books about Janis Joplin after she was dead or, or you know, an artist that had been, you know, a, a, a biography, Jim would then go back into his archive and pull some stuff out. But Jim had like uh, what I call his greatest hits, right? He had his, his favorite photos. And, and a lot of times Jim would just send out those same photos over and over again, Janice with the Southern Comfort bottle or Bob Dylan rolling the tire. And so it was after, um, after Jim passed away when Amelia and I and Benita started talking and saying, let's go in and scan all of the Grateful Dead or all of the Bob Dylan or all of the Johnny Cash. Um, and we did that with some of the big name artists, Santana, Cash, Dylan, The Stones, The Dead, The Almonds, Joan Baez, Airplane, Miles, Coltrane. Um, uh, those guys, Amelia and Benita would go in, they'd look through the proof sheets, they'd find everything they could, they'd give them to me. And, and Jim would mark these proof sheets with his grease pencil of his favorites. We made sure we scanned those, but Jim was very funny. Like he might have one or two shots on a roll of film that he would think were his favorites you know, the shots that he would share, put out there, make prints of. And I'd look at this proof sheet and I'd be like, okay, well, there's 14 other incredible photographs that nobody's ever seen. And so we would scan Jim's two and the other 14, and then we'd have 16. So like with the Grateful Dead or Jefferson Airplane, we have three, four, 500 images scanned of those archives of those artists, whereas Jim was only showing, you know, two, three, four, ten photos at, when he was right, but, but what we should talk about too, Jay, Jay, is that Jim, everybody thinks Jim was disorganized because, you know, he was a drug addict and he was um, crazy sometimes, but he was very, very organized when it came to his children and his archive. So he made three by five cards of each person he photographed. And on that three by five card, he numbered every single roll of film and corresponding proof sheet with that person on it and then put that on the card. So it was really easy for him if like Rolling Stone called up and said, we wanna do an issue on Jimi Hendrix. He just pulled a card that showed him every roll of film that he had shot of Jimi Hendrix and then he'd go through and get him. The one thing that we discovered is that Jim didn't cross reference. So if on a roll of Jimi Hendrix, there was Janis Joplin or there was the Grateful Dead, he didn't cross-reference that and put it on the Grateful Dead or Jefferson Airplanes card. So we discovered a lot of this stuff, which was frustrating because we're like, oh my God, these are such amazing photographs that Jim didn't cross-reference. So and, sometimes, and sometimes it would just be like one or two frames. Like, so for right. instance, there's a, we'll see the shot later. There's a picture of Bob Weir. Uh, I'll tell the story when we get to it. But um, real quick, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions um, submit them on the Facebook, the fans, wherever. We've got Harrison, Joe, Sam, and Quinn, the Relics team and the interns. They're there gathering your questions at the end of the presentation. We'll do a little Q&A with Amelia. So let's get started here. And, and, and some of the first stuff that we're going to show here uh, that a lot of people didn't know about Jim is that he was a street photographer. And so, um, you know, we've got pictures here of that Jim shot on the streets of San Francisco, the lady with the hat and the guy smoking a cigarette. On you know, North and that's, that's interesting because that's one of his, that's 1960 and that's in North Beach. So, you know, what you have to remember is Jim was photographing in the 60s and rock and roll really wasn't around yet. So what he had as his subjects were the people in the streets and jazz. And so that's what he really photographed. And, and that's what we're trying to showcase more of is that's where he honed his skill um, that he then took into his music photography and really defined how Jim photographed and showed you know, music photography and live music because he was self-taught. So Jim, the way he learned was to go out in the street and just photograph. And so he was an amazing technician from just learning through trial and error what worked, what didn't. So uh, he, he knew his lighting sources. He loved to use natural light. Um, and so you'll see that in a lot of these early photos, you'll see him developing his skill and his eye. And it's all, it's all documentary photography on the streets right. here, the three women and the black man at the counter and the, the kid with the gun next to the, the small car. Um, and so Jim was a documentary photographer, and I would say that his style of photographing rock bands was also documentary. Most of, very little of what he did was, hey, pose and look at me. It was all very, very candid stuff, which we'll see a lot of in here. I'm going to flip through some of these, Amelia, the kid with the gun. You can stop me at any time and talk about this. Uh, the young African-American kid. 
Uh, a lot of black people in the film were here. Tell me about the clown photo. That was literally one roll of film that Jim shot and that's in New York City. And that Jim moved to New York at the end of 62 and he stayed there until the end of 64, 1964. Um, and that's really where he did a lot of his street photography as well um, as his jazz. But this clown, it's, it's great. The Ringling Brothers Barlam, Barnum and Bailey Circus was in town in New York City and Jim just went there and shot. And this is just such a candid moment. Again, nothing is posed about this shot. This was backstage. You know, one of the clowns was taking a break and he got it. And one of the most um, amazing things about Jim's photography, I think, is I never feel like I'm a voyeur looking in. I feel like I'm a participant. I'm standing right there with that person in that moment. And that's what Jim is able to do in all of his photography his photographs, whether it's a clown or whether it's Mick Jagger, you feel like you're there. So now we have a series of photos that were taken down in Hazard, Kentucky, Hazard County, Kentucky in uh, 1963, I'm pretty sure it was. Yeah, I'm gonna flip through some of these while you talk about what this was, wh how he got this assignment, um, uh, what he was after, how it ended up getting published. Uh, but it starts with this, you know, downtown Hazard, Kentucky, scene you could see the cars from the late 50s and uh, the destitute and the uh, desperation in a lot of these people's um, faces go ahead and talk about yeah. this. Let's look through well, Jim um, Jim got an assignment to go to Hazard Kentucky and it was going to be about the coal mining families and you know income inequality basically and poverty in America um, and so Jim embedded himself he made friends with these coal mining um, families and they allowed him into their homes. And a lot of their homes, they were really poor. And so their homes were made out of cardboard, literally cardboard shacks. Um, but, and on some of the faces of the children and the, the adults, you can see smudges and it looks like it's coal, but it's actually coal sores. It's because they were inhaling all of the coal all the time that it caused sores on their face. Um, but Jim just treated them with dignity and respect and the, hum the humanity of them. And so when he took these photographs, he was very proud of them. The uh, writer actually did not go down to Kentucky with Jim. The writer looked at Jim's photographs and wrote a very, very condescending article. And Jim pulled it and he said, I am refusing to allow this to be published. He did not come down here with me. He's missed the whole point of this. And he, he felt that strongly about his work that he pulled it and he gave it to the Archdiocese of New York and it was published in Ramparts Magazine then. Um, so Jim had a lot of uh, integrity behind himself and he, he knew how he wanted his photographs represented and he never let anybody dictate or say what they should look like, what they can or can't look like. Um, and this is such an important subject in Jim's um, life because he always wanted to showcase the underdog. For him, it was really, really important to showcase people who weren't getting attention, whether it was for music or whether it was poverty, whatever it was, Jim wanted to use his camera as a tool to share that with the world. On November 22nd, 1963 was a, one of the most historic days in our country's history. John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Jim was not in Dallas. Jim was in New York City. And he has a series of photographs, which I have up here, the first one now, um, the New York World Telegram. These photos, the looks on these people's faces and, and the newspapers being held up are, tell such a intense, unique story. What, what happened? How did you, like, where, what was going on that Jim all of a sudden got these photographs of these people? Well, Jim, Jim actually was still in New York at that time. He was in the Time, time Life building when the news hit that uh, JFK had been shot and died. And so what they did was they told all the photographers in the building, just go, go downstairs, go to the streets, photograph the reaction of the people. And that's what Jim did. So it's just pure raw emotion of the news being told that the president of the United States had been shot and killed. Um, and there's, so, again, they're so powerful and you just really feel like you're standing there with, with everybody feeling that emotion with them. Um, I'm looking at the shot of the woman with the transistor radio yeah. with the veil in front of her face. I mean, just what, it, you know, just 
what a moment. I mean, again, newspapers and, and, and uh, you know, look, she's got an early version of an iPhone. It's a, it's a <laughs> prototype, you know, in, in 1963. Uh, and then the next one of the four guys, just everybody just staring blankly. People, yeah. our country was in shock. I mean, and, and it just shows it. Yeah. Um, all right, so, so another really important series of photographs that Jim did that were not music-based was when he went down to Mississippi. And here's this first sh uh, photo here of the colored laundromat. Um, why did he go to Mississippi? What was his assignment? Uh, who was he photographing? And, 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 and why do these photos exist of, you know, from Jim? Jim, you know, what's very interesting is uh, Jim w went down to Mississippi actually with uh, Joan Baez because Jim had, you know, developed a really close, and we'll get into this later with Joan Baez. Um, and he had photographed her at the Newport Folk Festivals. And after that, she went down to Mississippi because she was very active in, you know, uh, equality and segregation and, you know, getting blacks to vote. And so Jim went down there and experienced, he photographed when these members, CORE and SNCC, were going down and signing up blacks to vote and teaching them how to do that, which was really, really important. Um, and, and then there's a series of photos here with the police cars and whatnot. Yeah. What's, what's and going what on happened, here? yeah, there were three, uh, three students, Cheney, Schwarmer, and Goodman. Um, James Cheney was black and the other two were white Jewish students who had come down to sign blacks to vote. The Ku Klux Klan had actually kidnapped them, basically kidnapped them and killed them. And so uh, Jim, the face of Mrs. Cheney's face when she heard uh, that her son's body had been found by the FBI. That's so the Jim, shot that's right here right now that I have on. So yeah. that, that that's just shows you the pure emotion that was happening. But Jim was there at the moment she was told her son's body had been found. And this is the story that that film Mississippi's Burning is based on, right. correct? Correct, yeah. Right. Uh, Jim made a book called Peace. Uh, for many years, he photographed every single peace sign that he could see. I think he did it for about a decade, right? Early he 60s, did. the late 60s. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, it was a, a fun little book that the estate put out just a few years ago, uh, made up of peace signs. Uh, Jim put out a book, uh, I'm sorry, the estate put out a book um, a couple of years ago called Jazz Festival. Uh, Jim shot a lot of jazz. And this book, uh, this is uh, Miles Davis and Steve McQueen on the cover of the book. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton uh, wrote some wrote some text for this book. Uh, did he write the forward? Clinton wrote the forward yes, for it. Yes, Bill, Clinton, yeah, Bill, wrote Clinton, Bill Clinton wrote the forward for the book. Um, uh, you know, there's a famous photo that I've seen of Obama in the White House uh, pointing next to a John Coltrane photo that Jim took that lived yeah. in the White House also um, that was given to Obama. Uh, here's a shot of John Coltrane at the Monterey Jazz Festival in 1960, and then we get to these beautiful, beautiful black and white portraits that were taken in Berkeley. Um, talk to me about Coltrane, uh, Jim's connection to Coltrane, um, uh, where these portraits were taken and some of the other things around John, New York, San Francisco, where they were shot, why they were shot and stuff sure. like that. Sure. Well, this was um, this, this beautiful portrait of John Coltrane was 1960. And uh, like I said before, you know, San Francisco in North Beach was really one of the biggest places for jazz at that time. And so Jim was, would go in and out of all the um, jazz coffee houses and, and jet where they would play and perform and he met John Coltrane. So after one of the gigs, uh, Jim ran into John Coltrane and John Coltrane said, hey, do you know how to get to, where's Berkeley? Where is Berkeley? And Jim said, well, why? And he said, well, I have an interview with Ralph Gleason who was the San Francisco Chronicles um, music critic of the time. And he said, and I don't know how to get there. And Jim said, well, I'll drive you there. So Jim picked up John Coltrane. They went to Ralph Gleason's house in uh, Berkeley. And Jim was the only photographer there and just started snapping away and took these incredible photographs of John Coltrane in natural sunlight. Um, and the, the one, uh, this one was actually an album cover also, the black and white one. Um, but from that point, Jim developed a really strong friendship with John Coltrane and photographed him. And so when Jim moved to New York, um, he kept in, he had stayed in touch with John Coltrane and did a lot of photography of him for his albums and things like that. And there's a shot, I don't know if you 
have gotten to it. Yeah, the one in the, in the in the recording studio. In the recording studio, that's Van Gelder's studio in New York. Um, and then there's a shot of him in his back, a color shot of him in his backyard at Sunset in Queens, New York, which is absolutely gorgeous. And that became an album cover as well. Right, uh, so that was the Rain or Shine album cover. And that brings us to Miles Davis. And so this particular photograph uh, was really important in establishing Jim's relationship with Miles. So let's, let's go, I'm gonna uh, uh, go past the album cover. Uh, this first portrait of Miles is also, what, what year is this, uh, 1963? This is 61. 61. Yeah. So Jim had already connected with Miles, but Jim was, Jim was scared of Miles. I don't Jim think was... Jim has been scared of anybody in his whole life except for Miles Davis. <laughs> so, um, and there's the cover of the book, the Steve McQueen shot. And then, you know, there's the boxing ring photos. Tell me about the boxing ring photos and then tell me about that connection between Coltrane and Miles and Jim. Right. Well, actually, Jim, yes, he was, you know, Miles Davis was a force to be reckoned with. And uh, Jim was always afraid of, of Miles Davis. And so uh, Jim finally got enough courage one day and went up to Miles and said, hey, Miles, why do you have a green trumpet? And Miles looked at me and goes, hey, motherfucker, I didn't ask you why you had a black camera. Scared the shit out of Jim. And so Jim was just afraid of him for the next few years. And then he finally said, you know, this is ridiculous. I really, really want to get close to him and have these intimate photographs like I was able to do with John Coltrane. So Jim knew that Miles Davis loved John Coltrane and he loved that photograph, that color photo of uh, John Coltrane in his backyard in Queens. So Jim made that photograph, wrapped it up and then backstage of Winterland when uh, Miles Davis was done playing, Jim approached him and gave him this little package and Miles looked at it and then just kept talking with people. And uh, Jim goes, hey, Miles, open it. And Miles was like, later, later. So Jim got very frustrated. He started walking away. Miles Davis opened it up and he looked at it and he screamed at Jim. He goes, hey, Jim. And Jim turned around and he goes, yeah. He goes, this is John Coltrane. And Jim goes, I know. And he goes, I love John Coltrane. Jim goes, I know. And he goes, why don't you take pictures of me? like this. And Jim goes, why don't you let me? And it was from that point on, Miles Davis then gave Jim all access to photograph him. But it was because of that beautiful photograph, that intimate photograph that Jim took of John Coltrane that allowed him to get close to Miles Davis. And so he also had a lifelong uh, friendship with Miles Davis. And Miles loved to box. And so Jim photographed him um, two years in a row one was 1970 and the next one was 71 at New Newman's Gym in San Francisco. Um, and he was a good boxer, but he would always say to his sparring partner, don't, don't hit me in the mouth, I gotta play tonight. So they couldn't hit him in the mouth. And of course that ended up as a, 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 rec, a Miles Davis album cover, which we're looking at here. And then the shots of him in the red shirt are from the Isle of Wight show. Um, and the, uh, there's an interesting story of that yeah, Isle of Wight also. There's very few pictures of Miles Davis smiling. People didn't really get that. And as you can see in this, Jim was able to get Miles Davis to smile just to this candid moment. But the Isle of Wight, um, Miles had flown Jim out to the Isle of Wight to be his photographer for that. And uh, he had all the press passage and passes and the credentials. So he got, he was going up to stage and one of the um, security guys said, you can't go on stage. And he goes, but I'm with Miles. He flew me out here and he goes, you can't go on stage. So Jim yelled to Miles and he said, hey, Miles, he won't let me up here. So Miles came over and he looked at the security guy and he goes, you want me to go out there and tell those 300,000 crazy motherfuckers that you're not going to allow uh, Miles Davis to play? And the guy looked at him and he goes, after you, Mr. Marshall. And so Jim went up and was able to take him, but they, they had these, this great relationship, the two of them. Nice. Um, all right, we're gonna skip ahead here to the Allman Brothers. Uh, Dwayne Allman backstage. Dwayne and Jim had an incredible relationship, um, which of course translated to the rest of the band. You know, this, of course, there's the most legendary intimate shot of Dwayne rehearsing in the, in the bathroom at the Holiday Inn on Van Ness Avenue here in San Francisco. And, uh, uh, you know, this great candid portrait of Greg Allman in the 70s with the Ray-Bans and Dickie Betts and, and uh, that shot of, of Greg on stage at the Fillmore East with the little light bubble, which is used on that record, the live at the Fillmore East. Um, here's a shot of Bill Graham's Fillmore East marquee that says the Allman Brothers Band. Wasn't this 
originally shot to be the cover of Live at the Fillmore East. And tell me, tell me about why it wasn't and, and, how, and how they ended up shooting that cover um, and where they shot it and, and how that came about. Yeah, they, they, Jim was supposed, he was hired to shoot the Live at uh, Fillmore East cover. Um, and they just, nobody got into, they all hated it. They were like, this just doesn't have any energy. This doesn't show what it's like. Um, so they were trying to figure out what to do. And so when they went down to Macon, Georgia, this was outside when uh, a place that they were gonna be playing in Macon. And they had all of the, um, you know, cases stacked up. And Jim was like this, I think this could be a really cool shot, but something was missing because it was gonna be live at Delmar East. So he stenciled that onto the road cases and then he sat the guys down. The Allman Brothers are notorious for not smiling either, never like to smile. So Jim was getting really, really frustrated. So finally at one point he said to them, you guys, I'm the one with the Coke. If you want some Coke, you're gonna to have to smile. And they just cracked up and clicked. That's, that was the cover. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, two years ago, I was down in Macon, Georgia, and I went to the Allman Brothers Museum at the Big House. And uh, this amp case where it's stenciled, the Allman Brothers Band at the Phil Maurice is actually in that museum. And Kirk West, who, uh, you know, originally kind of put the big house together, bought the big house where the band lived back in the day and, and donated it to build the museum, told me the story that, you know, somebody stole that case somewhere along the way and the guy had it in his living room and then his wife wanted to get him out so he put it in the basement and then he moved it to the garage and eventually it got taken out of the garage and was thrown behind the garage and was just like out in the elements you know outside the rain the snow the sleet whatever and it sat there for another year or two until somebody discovered it and was like this is one of the most famous artifacts in Allman Brothers history mm -hmm. and it ended up I think Kirk was the one who ended up <clears throat> getting it and giving it to the museum and then, of course, you know, most people haven't seen the color version of, uh, of <clears throat> excuse me, the Allman Brothers shot there. And that's an outtake. Uh, then we get to the Beatles. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Beatles play at Candlestick Park in August of 1966. It's the very last time the Beatles will ever actually play in front of a paying audience. They did the Let It Be, you know, rooftop concert at, at Abbey Road. Uh, but this was their last professional paid gig. Uh, Jim was there. Jim met the band at the airport. I love the Pan Am flight attendant with the pillbox hat. Um, he shot them coming off the plane. He was there with them backstage. He was on, on the field with them. Uh, Joan Baez was hanging out backstage. Joan Baez was as big a rock star as the Beatles were in 1964. She was actually a bigger rock star than the Beatles were before the Beatles became rock stars. <laughs> because she was already playing arenas of 20,000 people in 1962. Right. Um, and so uh, tell us about this particular day of Jim hanging out with the Beatles at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. Well, it was crazy because nobody, actually nobody really knew that that was going to be their last live concert. So nobody expected that. Um, but at Candlestick Park, it was, it was a disaster. It was not a successful concert because they were in the middle of the field caged in right and it was stadium lighting and the acoustics were terrible and everybody were sitting in this the big stadium seats so people were miles miles so far away from them they couldn't really hear them the Beatles hair was blowing all over the place and uh and Jim was there documenting this piece of history but it was interesting too, because he not only did he do it when they were actually performing, but he did it backstage when they were in the dressing room waiting around to go up. And as Jay said, there was Joan Baez, you know, just completely in awe of the Beatles and what was happening. Um, but it was a really, it was a historic event that we didn't know until after it happened. I love the shots of uh, the fans trying to get onto the onto the field and the police just like tackling them. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, here, I'm just flipping through some of the live shots here. John and Paul singing into the microphone, through, Jim shooting through the fencing. You can yeah. see the fence here in front, how they were caged in. And yeah, you have to remember, like they probably had some sort of industrial PA sound system that, <laughs> I mean, if you were 20 feet away, you could probably hear it. But the closest right. the audience was to the stage was 
hundreds and hundreds of feet. They were in the middle of the baseball diamond and yeah. everybody was out in the outfield. I mean, by the time this, you know, and then we have everybody screaming, the fans, all the girls screaming, I'm sure you cannot hear anything. And I think they played like <laughs> 35 minutes is how long the set was and that was done. And yeah. then um, a couple of years ago, a few years back, Paul McCartney played at Candlestick. And that was the very, very, very last concert ever at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. And Paul McCartney closed it out. Another Planet Entertainment, our local promote, independent promoters, put that show on. And Paul McCartney invited Amelia and Benita as, their, as his guests to the show. And they showed a bunch of these photographs on the big you know, IMAX screens at that concert of, uh, of this shot of this show in 66. Uh, I remember when we ran into Paul McCartney having dinner after we were down at that Leica store event in LA a couple of years ago, and you walked up to Paul and introduced yourself. So that was, that was pretty fun. Yeah. Um, Bob Dylan, um, Jim's relationship with Bob went back really to the beginning. I mean, here's Bob, you know, smoking a cigarette, you know, this is, this is 1963, I believe. It was 62. 62 it was, and then yeah. this one is 63 with Pete's uh, at yeah. the village gate right and so yeah. Jim was there at the birth of this this folk movement with Bob Dylan uh, uh here's the shot with Jim I mean uh, Bob and, and Susie Rodolo who was Susie and then um there are all these photographs of uh actually then we get to Mon uh, we, I, I want you to talk a little bit about Susie and then we get to these photographs at Newport Folk and here's this one that I love of Bob playing on a four by eight sheet of plywood yeah. I mean here's Bob Dylan playing on a stage at Newport Folk in 62 or 63 is this, this one? This is 63. 63 yeah. on a little four by eight stage at Newport Folk. Um, and then we get to the shots in Greenwich Village with Bob, uh, Dave Van Ronk, who was sort of the mayor of McDougal Street, a folk singer, right. and Susie Rodolo. Tell us the story about this shoot, why they were walking around Greenwich Village, who they were, what they were doing, what's the story with the tire, and what, right. ended, up, what ended up happening with these photos? Well, this actually, as we said, Jim met Bob Dylan when he was in New York. And actually, interesting, a side note, Bob Dylan was the one that introduced Jim to Johnny Cash. So that's how that whole relationship started. Um, but Bob Dylan was just walking down the street. It was one afternoon. Susie Rodolo was his girlfriend at the time. After that, Bob then got involved with John Baez because John Baez was the one that really introduced him to the world at the uh, folk festivals. But um, Jim was there hanging out. They were walking down the street and he was just taking these photographs. And literally there was a tire on the side of the road and Bob Dylan just picked it up and started rolling it. And there, boom, Jim took it. Again, just capturing that moment, that split second, always being ready for whatever happened. Columbia Records then wanted to use some of these images for their album cover, but they didn't want to pay Jim what he wanted. So what they did was actually use Jim's photographs to recreate that with their own photographer, Don Hunstein, who was actually shooting for them at the time. So they recreated Jim's photographs for the album cover because they didn't want to pay Jim what Jim wanted. So that's, it's an interesting story. But again, this is just all access that Jim had with Bob Dylan at the very beginning of his um, you know, career when he was just still such a baby. And of course, um, Susie Rodolo is the woman that's on the cover of the freewheeling uh, Bob Dylan right. record. So they, right. she did make it onto a cover and Susie died <laughs> a few years ago, I remember. Right. Um, but I believe that technically she was Bob's girlfriend from 61 to 64, according to yeah. Wikipedia. And so there's a little <laughs> overlap with Joan Baez yes. here in this photo that we're looking at right here in 1963 at Newport Folk. And uh, uh, of course, Joan and Bob singing together at Newport Folk. And then here's uh, Bob and Joan with a little baby. And this baby was just a random baby because uh, everybody was saying, are you guys getting married? Are you getting married? And what they were joking around said, here's, yeah, this is our baby. Or it was just some random baby. <laughs> um, but we get to Joan Baez. And so here's a solo shot of Joan on stage. And I think this is 61 or 62. Yeah, so really. Joan, cool. Joan, you know, Jim was shooting jazz in San Francisco. It was just before he moved to New York. He meets Joan Baez. He photographs her. You know, here she is solo acoustic playing in front of 20,000 people, like in the Oakland Coliseum or the Cow Palace or you know, something like that. Like that's how big Joan Baez was back then. And Jim starts this relationship and he goes to Newport Folk and here's Joan walking down the streets with a crowd of people. This is sort of the beginning of that protesting and that trip that got him to Mississippi. 
Um, tell me a little bit about Joan and, and uh, Newport folk, and then we'll go into Joan and, and her husband, David Harris, the mm -hmm. anti-war uh, uh, activist, uh, draft dodger, yeah. Um, but he was really an activist and some of the other stuff that Joan did that Jim also was able to photograph. Yeah. Well, this is, this is a really important uh, photograph of Joan walking down the street in Newport because what they were doing is actually doing a trial run for the March on Washington, which was gonna be a couple months later after this. So they wanted to do a trial run in a, a very small contained space. So they did it at the Newport Folk Festival. and. Uh, Next to Joan is James um, Foreman, who was one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s right-hand men in the, the, the whole movement and civil rights movement. And she was joined by the freedom singers. So they marched down through the street to, uh, to a place where they then um, actually practiced all of their speeches and talked about them. Um, so we didn't really know about this until we started. It was in the archive. Jim never told me about this and Jim never, you know, published these photographs. So for us, it was just such an amazing experience to come across them in Jim's, uh, you know, archive and find them and see that Jim had documented all of these pieces of history that will never, ever happen again. And that we're really fortunate that Jim did so that we can look back at these. And I think it's so relevant, especially today with what is going on right now, that we have these pieces of history to look back on and really reflect, you know, how far we have not come actually, you yeah. know, even today. So here's Joan in the recording studio with her sister Mimi Farina. Um, this is them uh, in, uh, in Nashville with Stephen Stills, who they became friends with. Uh, Joan backstage, just sort of relaxing, taking a nap. Uh, Joan giving the peace sign, that's at Woodstock in 69. Uh, this is a shot here of Joan with her family. It's her sister Mimi, her other sister, and her mother and father. When Joan wanted a family photo taken of her and her family, she called Jim Marshall. Like, that was their relationship. Um, and then we get to David Harris. And here's a protest that happened at the Presidio. So here's Joan Baez, it's the late 60s at this point, and she's still one of the biggest celebrity musicians in our country. And she's here at this anti-war demonstration, standing on top of the back of a pickup truck with a board on top of it for 200 people, because this is what her and her husband believed in. So talk mm -hmm. to me a little bit about that relationship with um, David Harris and, uh, and Joan and the, and the whole anti-war thing. Yeah, I mean, the anti, she, she was one of the biggest um, peace activists in anti-war, anti-nuclear war. Um, and that's what she basically, you know, she devoted a lot of her, still does, to that cause. And uh, David Harris was a conscientious objector. So because of that, he dodged, you know, he, did, he refused to go and be in the war and he was jailed. So they were married and here he was, being thrown into jail and she was pregnant at the time actually with their son Gabriel and so you'll see some photos that come up where Jim was on assignment for Look magazine and he went with Joan on the plane to go get David Harris when he was released from jail and by this time she had had her son and so it was really the first time that David Harris got to see his little baby and his son and, uh, and Jim was there to record it all. So. And there's the press conference is what I'm looking at right now. And here's another shot of Joan and David. This is Joan up on a hill down near where she lives south of San Francisco in the 70s. I mean, Jim's relationship with Joan lasted until the until until Jim died. And like I said earlier, I believe um, Joan sang at Jim's memorial service yeah. Uh, yeah. that we all put together. Um, Amelia and Benita were sort of spearheading it and they put a little little committee together that I was part of and, and uh, we organized Jim's Memorial and, and Joan came and, and sang a half a dozen songs at that. Uh, the last shot we have of Joan here is a very famous photo because it's a picture of Joan and her two sisters. And it was made into this poster called Girls Say Yes to Boys Who Say No. Right. Um, and this poster was in every dorm room, everywhere in every girl's dorm room. And it, of course this was a draft it was, it had nothing to do with sex. It was, it was all about boys who say no to the draft. You know, it was, it was a, a legendary counterculture poster 
that's uh, shown up in, in lots of documentaries and whatnot. Um, uh, Joan was a big part of the Big Sur Folk Festival. Uh, started in 1964, went to 1971. Uh, Joan was there, I believe, every year. I don't think Jim shot it every year, but he shot several of them. Some of the photos that we're gonna look at here are specifically from 1969. And uh, this was sort of the power of Joan Baez and her stature in the community. So this first shot here, it's Joan, Mimi Farina, and that's Judy Collins. Uh, here's Joan, there's a full uh, uh, camera crew for surrounding her. You can go on YouTube and you can actually see a lot of clips from this documentary movie that was made. Uh, but here she is sort of holding court and talking to Joni Mitchell, Graham Nash, Stephen Stills, and John Sebastian. Uh, here she is dancing with, with some of the sing gospel singers, dancing again with her sister, with the crew. And, and in between, it was weird where this was at Esalon, uh, there was a giant swimming pool in the middle where the stage was. So the band was playing and there was a swimming pool in front of them. So there was nobody right in front of the band when they were playing. And then all the fans were on the other side of the swimming pool. And of course, this is the year that we had Crosby, Stills and Nash and Young come and play. And uh, CSN also did a set. Uh, Joni Mitchell was dating Graham Nash at the time, um, you know, just such, you know, here's this great shot of Graham, Joni, John Sebastian, Stephen Stills, uh, and Joan Baez all up there on stage singing. And you can see it's a true, uh, you know, Bay Area, San Francisco, uh, West Coast thing because it's completely fogged in, freezing cold. Um, you know, Esalon, Big Sur. Well, also, actually, the, um, and the Big Sur Folk Festival, um, was started and Joan actually by another woman and Joan was um, there to teach music and what it was developed as was because this was in the summer after all of the musicians had gone on tour and were kind of did all of their summer touring this was a place for them to come and kind of chill out and get together and you know um, hang out again and so that's why it became kind of like this family of musicians who came to this every single year after they were done with their tour and they could just hang out with each other and relax. And uh, it's just, it was such an interesting, unique kind of festival that went on and that, that doesn't go on today. You know, it, it ne you'll never see something like that again. Right, I mean, Joni Mitchell was just there because she was living with Graham Nash. And here's this photo that I have up here of Graham and Joni. You could just see the intensity of their love affair um, yeah. in their eyes and the way they look at each other and this close up of David Crosby. Um, and that brings us to this series of photographs of David Crosby. I'm gonna tell this story here. Um, so while we were uh, editing photos, looking for whatever we were looking for, I came across a one and a half rolls of film, one and a half proof sheets of these photographs of David Crosby in the studio. And I knew right away that this was them recording a record called If Only I Could Remember My Name, which is this legendary solo David Crosby record. And it sort of also was sort of the birth of what that later became the, the Perro Sessions, Planet Earth Rock and Roll Orchestra. And so in this particular photograph here, you have Garcia, Crosby, Neil Young, Phil Lesh on bass, Michael Shree from Santana's band is on, on drums. And, uh, and I took this photograph and I sent it to, I called Paul Haggard, who was the art director, guitar player magazine, good friend of Jim's, uh, Jim was a good friend of guitar player. They always did a lot of stuff together. They used Jim's photos all the time. And I said, I found this photo that nobody's ever seen and nobody even knew existed. And, I, and, and they published it in Guitar Player as a two page spread. And a guy named Steve Silberman, who's David Crosby's biographer, he saw the photo, freaked out, called me up. I'm friends with Steve also, called Crosby. Crosby's like, I didn't know that anybody was even there. I didn't know anybody ever even took any pictures during these sessions. Right? And there's only one and a half rolls of film from this whole session. And, uh, and, a, and, and, a, and a, a year or two later, Crosby, Sills and Nash played at the Fillmore in San Francisco. And I took a bunch of these photos from the session and I put them on my phone to show to Graham and David, right? So Graham Nash is, was a dear friend of Jim Marshall's, right? They really they did a lot of stuff together. Um, you know, Graham is a big fan of photography, he was a big collector. He was a photographer himself. And so over the last 10 years, if I have a hard time IDing somebody or in a photo, I would email it to Graham. And Graham would be like, oh yeah, that's so-and-so, so-and-so at this date, on this place, at this time, during this show. Like Graham knows everything, it, he's amazing. So I break out this photo and I show it to Graham. And Graham looks at it and he goes, oh yeah, it's the, uh, if only I can remember my name sessions. And oh yeah, that day they were recording the song Cowboy Movie. 
And oh yeah, David's wearing a red t-shirt. I'm like, it's a black and white photo. He's like, I know, but I remember. And then of course he goes over and shows them to Crosby who's freaking out, right? About these photos. He's like, oh my God, I've only seen the one. I can't believe this is so amazing. He's like, he's like, I, he's looking at me. He's like, I love you, man. I love you for showing me these photos. And Crosby's freaking out. And, and then at that moment, Graham looks at me and goes, do you have any photos, like really things that people haven't seen of Stephen Stills? I'm editing the photos for the Stephen Stills box set. So I go back, I call Amelia. She brings over the Stephen Stills stuff. I scan a bunch of it. I send it to Graham and it ends up the cover of the Stephen Stills box set five years ago, six years ago, yeah. whenever that came out. So it's just a full circle how this stuff happens. You know, show somebody a picture on your phone of them from 40 years ago and you get the album cover of the box set 40 years later. It's just, it's just amazing. So, and on top of that, when Graham told me he was um, uh, doing this box set and, and Jim ends up with the cover of the Stills box set, I go, hey, can I send you a few photos that I took of CSN when I was in high school, when I was 17 years old and he says, sure. And, and Graham used one of my shots of CSN from September of 79, uh, taken at Madison Square Garden during the No Nukes concert. So everybody, everybody won on that one. It was amazing. Um, and that brings us to the Grateful Dead. Again, you know, Jim had a, a, a love-hate relationship with those guys. And that was only because the Grateful Dead were very, very difficult. I can speak firsthand experience from this. They are very difficult people to photograph because they don't like to be photographed because they've been doing it for so long. And even back then, you know, Marshall would be climbing on amps and the roadies would be like, motherfucking Marshall. And Marshall would look at these roadies that were twice the size of him. He'd be like, who the fuck are you talking to, motherfucker? Like he wouldn't back down. You know, Jim was a tough little, you know, three foot, six inch motherfucker, right? I mean, how tall was Jim, uh, Amelia? Was he five foot three or something? He was, yeah, he was, he, he would lean on me. I was taller and I'm five, four. <laughs> okay, so there you go. But Jim was a mean ass dude and you did not want to fuck with Jim Marshall, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can all tell you legendary stories. I mean, I was lucky that Jim only pulled a gun on me once, right? And that's being lucky. But again, it makes for a great story because, you know, Jim, Jim couldn't, I was supposed to bring him some money for some prints. And he needed some Coke money. And, and, I, and, and he called me late in the afternoon. The banks were closed. I went to the ATM. He could only take $200 out. I brought him $200. And he looked at me. He was coked up and fucking buzzed his shit. You know, this is, I'm not telling anything that nobody knows, doesn't know about Jim. And, uh, and he said, where's my money? And I said, I got $200. He's like, fuck you, Blakesburg. And he pulls the gun out and slaps it on the table. And he goes, I need that fucking money. And he like, I, I just ran. I I'm like, I got to go, Jim. I'm out. And I left. He called me three days later. He told me to never come back. He said, fuck that. You're not getting the prints of the Beatles that somebody was buying that I was bringing in the cash for. Calls me three days later. He's like, hey, Blakesburg, come on over. Bring me a check for the rest of the money you owe me. Like, he didn't even remember the whole incident, the gun, anything. But um, again, that was just a whole nother side of Jim, but he still had that heart of gold. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so with the Grateful Dead, here's this is an acid test in 66. Uh, this is one of the first portraits that was ever really done of the dead in 67. Um, this is a, a, a legendary shot taken in 66. We've all seen this photo where Jim's lying on the ground and he's shooting up at these guys. Of course, they gave him the finger, flipping him the bird, which is a theme throughout Jim's life uh, because uh, there's a it lot of- It was Jim's hello to people. Jim's hello to people, right? Flipping the bird. Um, we'll, we'll see more of that. Uh, and then I found this color slide here of uh, Jim must have handed his camera to somebody that he was with. And when I saw this photograph of Jim lying on the ground, I knew exactly where it was. The Fillmore is directly across the street. And this dirt lot that he's photographing him on is actually the Boom Boom Room. One time it was called the John Lee Hooker's Boom Boom Room. And it's a little blues uh, bar that's on the corner right across the street from the Fillmore. And so it's like things like this that revealed the history of where Jim took these photos. And when we, he took these photos, because... Uh, there's another series of photos like this with the airplane where he's looking up at them. And I always thought they were taken the same day because the dead and the airplane were in the same spot. But I found out later that these were taken of the dead by themselves in front of the Fillmore and the airplane ones were taken in Golden Gate Park. Yeah. So Amelia, tell us a little bit about, um, I'm going to flip through these, just talk about the Grateful Dead. You know, here's Jerry in the, in the park, in, in Golden Gate Park with uh, uh, the Panhandle free concert in 66, lip syncing at KQED. Monterey Pop. Oh, here's the shot that we were talking about earlier. I'm sorry. Um, I'll give it to you in a second, Amelia. This is a shot of Bob Weir uh, in this eye makeup at the Tripper Freak Show, which was a Halloween show in 1966. 
with uh, Janis Joplin. And this shot here was on a roll of film that was just Janis Joplin. And there were five frames of Bob Weir taken in the mirror backstage like this. And so it was never labeled on a Grateful Dead card. And when we were editing Janis Joplin photos, I came across this and it's like, oh my God, here's five pictures of Bob Weir in makeup that nobody has ever seen. And that's how we would discover things. Um, Jim, of course, did one of the first photos with Mickey Hart when he joined the band. Uh, this is a portrait that we actually used on a book that I published a couple of years ago called Eyes of the World. We used Jim's photo because we wanted a photo that had Mickey and Pigpen in it. And there's not a lot of portraits of the band. Jim's one of the few people that have a portrait of just this lineup right here. Um, and then there's the press conference. Tell us about this press conference that happened at 710. Well, they were, they were basically, they were set up by the police um, for, you know, selling and distributing marijuana. And so um, it was a complete setup. It was unfair. Um, and Jim was there basically when they decided to do a press conference and, and notify, basically shared with people what had happened and that it was wrong. So Jim Jim was there photographing all of this that had been taking place. But he also, with the Grateful Dead, as much as he loved them, he also hated the Grateful Dead because they did a lot of acid and acid was not Jim's drug of choice, cocaine was. And so they were constantly, they were known for dosing people and putting it in as a joke and that people wouldn't know and which bugged the shit out of Jim because he did not want to be hallucinating. And uh, later on, I don't know if we have that photo from um, Woodstock, but there's a big orange photograph that was in the album um, for Woodstock where it's uh, Jim is in the rafters looking down and Carlos Santana is actually playing on stage with the crowd in the background. And the, uh, the only reason Jim was up there was because Jim was terrified of heights, terrified. Well, the dead had dosed him and he thought he was a monkey. So he climbed up the rafters took this picture and then couldn't really figure out how to get down. So finally figured out. But he, when he realized he had done that after the acid trip, he was like, those motherfuckers, I would have never done that if I hadn't been dosed. Yeah, so, and, and of course, uh, later on in life in, in the Grateful Dead's career, by the late seventies, they were a cocaine band and not an acid. Right. Well, they were still an acid right. band, but they really loved their cocaine too. Yeah. So Jim probably had, he probably had some good times with them. Uh, and we will show that orange photo later. I don't know if it's going where Santana's on stage or not. I know it's just one of them where he's up there. I don't know if it's before they went on or what. But uh, anyway, but also we have these very, very famous photos that Jim took of um, the Grateful Dead on Haight Street on March 3rd, 1968. Right. Now, this photo that's up here now, you can see the stage was all the way down the end of Haight Street, uh, closest to Stan and closest to Golden Gate Park. And so you can see that this crowd goes all the way down you know, four, five, six, seven blocks. Again, we're talking an industrial PA system where mm -hmm. you're lucky if the sound traveled cleanly for the first hundred feet. So it just go, showed the power of, of the Grateful Dead, of the Haight-Ashbury. And, and by March of 68, the Haight-Ashbury was dying. You know, it was mm -hmm. becoming drug infested. The media had, had, had ingested it, chewed it up, spit it out. Um, you know, the Grateful Dead were leaving, everybody was leaving, but still, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people come to the hate. And of course, Jim gets these legendary photos. Here's Mickey Hart. And then there's this one here of Phil Kreutzmann and, and Jerry, um, which is just a classic legendary photo. And it's inside the live dead record. Um, this shot here of Jerry was taken at Woodstock. And um, this all leads up to the gatefold in the live dead record, which we're looking at here. And you can see one of the Mickey shots there, the big crowd shot. There's Jerry at Woodstock. And there's other photos in here by Herb Green and Rosie McGee and, 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 and whatnot. Um, but again, for me as a teenager, you know, getting this record and looking at this and reading the credits and saying, oh, my God, Hate Street. Uh, you know, they did the Hate Street Fair for many, many years. I think they still do the Hate Street Fair, not this year, obviously, in June. And I remember being on stage with the Jefferson Starship one year and me being behind the band. And all I could think about was, how do I get the shot like Jim Marshall got the shot? You mm -hmm. know, like that's what's running through my mind is, you know, here I am 30 years later, 20 years later, whatever it was. How do I get that shot to look like it? And I have something, but it's not 
the gym shot, you know? Um, and then of course, this is the band Woods, uh, on stage at Woodstock and you can see there's cameramen everywhere leaning down in front of the band. There's one in front of Jerry, one in front of Kreutzmann. There's another guy, you can see his foot on the right, you know, and, and the Grateful Dead have always said how um, Woodstock was one of their worst performances yeah. ever. You know, the, the, uh, the band, the stage wasn't grounded. It was, it was wet. Every time they put their lips up to the microphone, they would get a shock. Um, there's camera crews in their face. And that's why the Grateful Dead are not in the Grateful Dead movie. A um, few more Grateful Dead shows, shots here, and then we'll move on. Bob Weir in 1972. This is Garcia in the back of a van in 1975 when the Grateful Dead did the big free concert in uh, Golden Gate Park in, in Lindley Meadow. Here's a shot from that show. Uh, it was this Jefferson Starship and the Grateful Dead. And then Jim did a portrait of them. You know, one of the few portraits of them mid-career. Uh, Donna and Keith were fairly new members of the band. I think this is either, I think this is 75 or 76. Um, and then of course you get to Jerry up at Front Street in 78 with the series of portraits he did with the guitar. And of course the wine glass, which became another legendary photograph just because it's Jerry toasting the world, you know? <laughs> pictures of Jerry toasting the world and it became the cover of a bootleg record farewell to winterland which was the closing of winterland um anything else on the grateful dead that you want to say or should we move on to bob dylan and johnny cash yeah let's move on to bob dylan and johnny cash so here are a couple of shots of bob and, and and john on the johnny cash show and like amelia said it was um bob who introduced uh jim to johnny uh that one of those photos from that session was on a, a record called the Dylan Cash Session. Again, a bootleg record. But look, you can see they've got Jim's credit right on the on the cover of the record. Um, you know, bootleg records were a common thing when I was growing up. All the time, there was bootleg records that would come out. They'd be made in Europe or wherever, and uh, you know, it was a thing. Which is why the Grateful Dead allowing their fans to tape them became so controversial at first. Um, so, well, but tell me about the relationship with Johnny and Jim. Yeah, what's, well, what's interesting about this um, one with Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash, Johnny Cash really, really was good friends with Bob Dylan. Um, Bob Dylan had been in a really bad motor, motorcycle accident in 1967, and he became kind of a hermit and a recluse, and he would not go out or allow anybody to photograph him. So Johnny Cash had a TV show from 1969 to 1971. It didn't last that long, but he had all these great guests on it. And Jim was, you know, the photographer for the show. He was there. And this was his very, this was Johnny Cash's very first show. And he wanted Bob Dylan to be his first guest. So it was because of the friendship that they had that Bob Dylan came out of basically hiding and um, started to perform again, but it was on the Johnny Cash show. Um, so that's what led to that. And then as a lot of people know that Jim was the photographer for Johnny Cash for the Folsom and San Quentin prison concerts. And I think, are we gonna be getting to those? Uh, go, go back a little bit and talk about Thanksgiving at the Cash House with June and then with uh, Shel Silverstein. Yeah, well, um, they would have in Hendersonville, uh, Tennessee, they would have Thanksgiving, you know, parties, and Jim was always invited. And what was really beautiful, this is such an iconic shot of Johnny Cash and June Carter, because they had this love for each other and respect. And uh, Jim was, again, it's just the power of Jim being able to capture that moment in time, where, and again, this is so intimate, but you don't feel like you're invading their space at all. You feel like you're sitting right next to them with this very intimate moment. And they were actually listening to Shel Silverstein play because Shel Silverstein was there as well. And uh, a lot of people don't realize he, he wrote The Giving Tree, but he also wrote the lyrics for A Boy Named Sue. So he was a songwriter as well. And so Jim captured, uh, captured that um, too. And then we get to Folsom Prison um, and then they're, they're in the bus. So go ahead and tell me about Folsom and how that uh, went down and Jim's involvement. And while you're doing that, I'll flip through photos and- uh, and um... So J Johnny Cash really, really believed in uh, shining a light on prisoner reform um, because he, he believed that, you know, prisoners were not treated like human beings. They were shoved in these dirty uh, jails and he was thinking he he was just thinking what can i do to shine a light on it and so he wanted to do two live recordings 
one year after another. The first one was Folsom. The second one was San Quentin. And he said, I want Jim Marshall to be my photographer. So Jim went with Johnny Cash when he um, did these live recordings and was really the only photographer there. And he got these amazing photographs of this historic event that was happening. Um, and again, true to Jim Marshall form, all natural light, decisive moment, taking it as it's coming. Um, Here's a, I'm on the shot of Glenn Shirley. Um, tell us who Shirley was. Glenn Shirley wrote uh, Greystone Chapel and he had showed it to Johnny Cash and Johnny Cash loved it so much, but he didn't tell Glenn Shirley that he was gonna be performing it when they actually were there recording. And so uh, Glenn Shirley was surprised and, and just completely shocked and blown away when Johnny Cash sang Greystone Chapel. And you can see him going and shaking his hand and um, talking to Glenn Shirley. Um, but that was just, you know, the way Johnny Cash was recognizing somebody who had done this important song for this really, um, you know, historic event that was going on. Of course, there's June in the background looking over uh, from the side of the stage there. And then uh, I, I guess before or after the performance, they did all these portraits of Johnny around the prison outside the front gates yeah. and with June and Johnny. And, and what's really interesting that a lot of people don't know about Jim is he always had like five cameras around his neck and he always had one camera filled with color. So, you know, most people don't know a lot of Jim's color photography, but he always had one camera filled with Kodachrome so that he could just go in, go pick one up, put it down, pick the other one up, put it down. So he was always prepared and ready to capture whatever he wanted. And uh, that was kind of one of Jim's little secrets is that he always had these cameras around his neck. So he would never miss, you know, a moment that happened. And of course, this is um, showing the cover, Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison. There's the close-up of Johnny. We all know this cover inside and out because it's iconic. And then um, right after that, this is at Newport Folk, right? Where he's signing the autographs. Isn't that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Right? And then so signing autographs. And then we get to what is perhaps the most iconic photograph in the history of music photography. Most ripped off um, photograph and, uh, ever. You know, as, as we were saying earlier, Jim always, uh, you know, giving the one finger salute. What's the, this is, and, and most people think this is Folsom Prison, but this is actually right. this is, this is, the next year. How did this photograph come, come about? And I'm gonna say that this is the iconic photo, but there are actually three frames that Jim shot right. or three pictures and Jim did not have a motor drive. So that's not like, no. that's click, 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 but it's still, you can see on the proof sheet, this sort of motion of Johnny moving while it's happening. And right. Jim, you know, th there's no autofocus. This is yeah. Jim manually focusing with a Leica, which is not very easy. And right. click, 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 three in a row. But this is the one that we're all this accustomed to seeing. And this was, this was at Soundcheck. And so Jim, there's many different stories, but I will tell you the story that was told to me by Jim himself, which was, um, he said to Johnny, let's do one for the warden. And that, that was Johnny's response to that. Again, to, because he was disgusted by the quality of life that these prisoners were, they had, and that they were not being treated like human beings. And so this was his way of, you know, saying, fuck you to the warden. But it's interesting because you see in the background and um, John Carter Cash, Johnny's son, said he loves this photograph, not only for the defiance, but because his grandmother, Mother Mabel Carter, is walking in the background there. And so he said, you know, here I have my dad and my, my grandma in one of the most famous rebellious photographs ever taken of Johnny Cash. So right. And, and of course, this photo is soon to be on a t-shirt everywhere in the world for <laughs> decades and on every dorm room wall on a poster. I mean, it really is, you know, one of those photographs that is such a statement and has been used in so many ways. And it, and it kind of took on a, on a life of its own. Like a lot of, you know, Jim's photographs, a lot of iconic Jim photographs just take on a life because they're timeless. I mean, this can stand for so many different things. So the, uh, Rolling, so the Rolling Stones come to San Francisco. It's 1964. They're playing at the Cow Palace. I mean, are they playing at the Bill Graham Civic, which at the time was the San Francisco Civic? And here's some backstage shots of the young Mick and Keith and Brian Jones. Um, this picture of Keith Richards, I, I love this picture because we all know what Keith Richards looks like today. And, uh, you know, and all the jokes that come along with it. But this is a young Keith Richard with 
Richards with not one wrinkle on his face. Um, and this shot here is the is the Civic Center, right? It's the San Francisco yeah. Civic <laughs> Center. And and but you can see the police sort of coming on. But look at this next photo here. This is the Civic Center where I've been to a million shows. We see bands like Fish and Phil Lesh and Bob Weir. Look at the balcony. The, this venue holds about 8,000 people. The balcony is empty. The police are on stage. It's 1964, I believe. And the Rolling Stones can't even sell <laughs> three or 4,000 tickets in the United States and San Francisco. And of course they come back to conquer the world. Here's Brian Jones and Jimi Hendrix at Monterey Pop, which is a very, very <laughs> iconic, legendary photograph. Um, I love this photograph here of Brian Jones and Dennis Hopper. You know, and, it, and, it, and it's been said that Dennis Hopper modeled his character as the photographer in the movie Apocalypse Now after Jim Marshall. Is that true, yeah, Amelia? That is true. Yes, he did. And, you know, Dennis Hopper was a really good photographer himself. So he was actually at the Monterey Pop Festival, as you can see. You can't see his uh, his little tag, but it says that he's a photographer. He yeah, it says a press. No, you can read it. It says press photographer. It's a press. So he was there as a photographer. But, um, yeah, again, he would see Jim with these five, six Leicas hanging around his neck, you know, running up to people taking photographs. And that's, if you watch Apocalypse Now, you can really see Jim in that character and that portrayal. You can, you know, hey man, hey man, let me take your photograph. Wait, 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 let me get this. And it's funny because after uh, I heard that I rented Apocalypse Now and I'm like, God, that is Jim. That really is Jim. So he got him down. Yeah. Uh, this is the Stones, I believe, in 69. And then we get to the 72 tour. Jim shot, I think, just uh, one show in 69, right? Um, no, that's not 69. That's 72. Oh, that's 72 also. So Jim, so Jim goes on the road with the band on the West Coast. Um, and so, Amelia, talk to me about um, who we were shooting for, who was on tour, um, who, what other photographers were there. And uh, while you're doing that, I'll flip through some of these photos. And uh, it starts with a shot of Mick with the bare yeah. chest on stage. Yeah. And, uh, well, and I just want to also point out when we get to some of these shots, you know, some of these backstage shots, like nowadays, you, you know, at a stadium show with the Rolling Stones, you know, Mick has his own, his own wing of the arena that's his dressing room. And every band member has that. And back then there was, you know, all everybody just hanging out in one spot. So go ahead, Amelia. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim actually was hired by Life Magazine. He uh, submitted 10 photographs and got picked as the photographer for Life to cover the West Coast leg of the Stone 72 tour. And so uh, he did that. And the, the other photographers that were on tour as well with them were um, Ethan Russell and Annie Leibovitz was there and Ken Regan. So, but Jim was actually the official photographer for that West Coast leg part of it. And, and you wonder the, uh, this, I got a, the shot of Stevie. Was he the opening act just on the West Coast, do you know? Or? Yeah, see, I think so. He was just the West Coast. So Stevie Wonder, you know, the shot of him at, at uh, that was at Winterland. He was opening up for the Stones, which is so interesting. I never, you know, you'd never think that those two groups together, but they did. He played. And uh, this was at the height of the Stones, basically the height of their careers. I mean, the 72 tour really set the mark for huge stadium, multi-million dollar tours. Um, and that was because of this big, huge tour that the successful tour that they did. And I don't know if you if you're showing some of the shots on the plane. Not but, yet. No, we're still. I'm in the recording studio in LA. So in why don't you talk about the recording studio? That was Exile on Main Street, and they went back during that tour, Mick and Keith, to re-record some of the vocals. And so Jim uh, was actually the only photographer there, and so he got these really iconic, beautiful photographs of Keith and Mick re-recording the vocals for Exile. On Main <laughs> And those portraits that we saw of Mick a little bit earlier were from this same day when they were down in LA for the session. And then, so here's the plane with Mick walking by with the tongue and now they're on the plane. And uh, this is the, the plane, shot of Mick with, with Robert Frank. With Robert Frank, because Robert, Robert Frank was on tour with them. He was filming Cocksucker Blues. So- uh, For those of you guys who don't know, so, so Robert Frank, first of all, is a legendary American street photographer. He did a groundbreaking book called The Americans. Very, 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 very famous. Actually, he's a Canadian photographer. Um, right. and, and, uh, but he was making a documentary film called Cocksucker Blues, which was a gritty, dirty, nasty film that was never properly released because it was so 
so kind of intense that I believe he had a deal that he could show it once a year at a film festival yeah. and that was it. And, uh, but he was with the band backstage on the plane everywhere. But um, whenever it showed, he had to be present. So they, you know, he had to be present at wherever this shown. So that was one of the things as well. But, you know, of course you could always get it off the internet because it went viral and people did the bootleg yeah. things. But, um, and then here's a Keith backstage with the, with the Jack Daniels bottle. And then Mick, of course, also, these are both legendary, iconic photographs of these guys. Right. And what's interesting too, is again, what you can see is here, Jim was not only doing these performance shots, but also backstage, these quiet moments when they're, you know, just waiting around doing nothing. And uh, again, he photographs them as these gods, but then he makes them human beings and real when he goes backstage and starts photographing them. And Mick Jagger looks like a little kid. I mean, really innocent, but um, that was Jim. He's like, you know, he's doing his stretching exercises and yeah. people are just he's like, joking. you know, Robert Frank's over in the corner having a conversation with some people and these guys on the couch, who knows who they even are? You know, they're not in the band, they're crew guys, they're hanging around, they're drug dealers, who knows? You know, and then of course you get the famous shot of Mick on stage, which became the cover of Life Magazine in 1970. Right. And that was actually shot on the West Coast. A lot of people, this, but this was when they were at Mad Madison Square Garden where they ended their tour. And a lot of people thought that this was Mad Madison Square Garden, but it wasn't because they didn't have enough time. By the time they were playing at Madison Square Garden, the cover had come out. So they had to use gems that he photographed on the West Coast to put on the cover of that magazine. And then we get to Altamont. And, um, the, you know, Jim went to Altamont, which of course, you know, we all know the story and the Hells Angels and the, the death and the stabbing and the beating with the pool cues. Um, I'm going to flip through a couple of quick photos, but because um, uh, there's not a lot of photos that Jim has for a really, you know, strange reason. So here's the stones on stage. Uh, and, the, and, and oddly enough, the only photographs that we have that Jim took from Altamont are in color. We have no black and white shots, which is really odd. This is Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young on stage. This is the Flying Burrito Brothers. You can see the Hells Angels over there. This is Carlos Santana on stage at Altamont. Um, tell me why we don't have a big collection of photographs from Jim at Altamont. Well, it was really just, it was poorly thought out, really. I mean, this was at the Speedway. It was in the middle of these mountains. Again, they plopped the stage right in the middle. There was, it was hard to get in and it was hard to get out. And they had the Hells Angels as the security. And so they, you know, of course were doing on bad acid trips. They were drinking. It was just a disaster. Um, during the day, the day was better than the nighttime because the day it was, you could see things. When night rolled around, it just got really, really ugly and bad. And as you know, somebody, uh, a young black man got stabbed and he died because there was no way to get him out of there. And so, um, and that all happened as, you know, Mick Jagger was singing Sympathy for the Devil, which was just frightening. And he even tried to calm people down and they just wouldn't calm down. So the helicopter flew in to take out the Stones and Bill Graham and Jim was so frightened for his life that he grabbed everything and he got on the helicopter with them. And in the process of that, he lost 17 rolls of film because he was scrambling so much just to get the fuck out of there. He said it was just, he was, he was, he thought he would die. It was so bad. Um, so because of that, we do not have many rolls of film of Alt Altamont because Jim lost them. Um, just want to remind everybody, you know, uh, ask your questions, put them in the comments on anywhere that you're watching. We're watching all the feeds. We have the, the intern team of Harrison, Joe, Sam, and Quinn. So please put some questions in there. We're going to get to them probably in about 20 minutes or so. Um, here's Bill Graham again with the one finger salute. Uh, this is an interesting story. This photograph used to hang backstage at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco. And uh, Bruce Weber came and did a, an ad campaign for, I think you said Ralph Lauren, maybe. Ralph Lauren, and yeah. It ended up in an ad in the background. And of course, uh, Jim was mad as hell that his photo was in an ad campaign. So he sued uh, Ralph Lauren and Bruce Weber and whoever else he could. And, and I believe he ended up with a brand new Mercedes or a BMW yeah. or something like that. No, he got a Mercedes. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Um, Chris Christopherson and Jim had a really strong relationship. Here's Waylon Jennings. 
uh, Merle Haggard. So Jim was shooting this outlaw country, you know, Johnny Cash was the introduction, but I mean, again, you know, this is not, this picture of Merle Haggard just says so much, right? And it's not Jim saying, hey Merle, look at the camera. It was all right. about Jim being invisible, being a right. fly on the wall and capturing these authentic moments of these people in these real life situations. Cause you have to remember that, you know, Merle Haggard and Johnny Cat, like it was not glitz and glam and, and, and the way it is now, the entertainment industry was just different than it was now. And of course that shot ended up, you know, as another record, you know, Merle Haggard, uh, uh, my farewell to Elvis record. Um, and that brings us to a thing called Dripping Springs Reunion. So the Dripping Springs Reunion, uh, we'll have Amelia tell us a little bit more about it, but basically some guys down in, in, in Austin said, hey, let's do a, a, a big festival that will be the introduction of outlaw country to the world. And we're gonna do they it. Also, they also wanted it to be the uh, country Woodstock. So that's, that's that right. was their idea of the country, country Woodstock. Woodstock. And 20,000 people are going to come per day and it's going to be this incredible thing and it's going to introduce all the old school artists, you know, like Hank Snow and Dottie West and, you know, to the new school hippies in, in Austin and, and blah, blah, blah. And so they do the Dripping Springs reunion and, um, and there's all these incredible musicians that are there to play and nobody shows up, right? But tell us about, so, so I'll flip through photos, talk to me a little bit about Dripping Springs and I'll hit some of these photos. You know, here's Willie Nelson and Leon Russell and, and Chris Christopherson with Willie and Whalen and Willie in, the report, in a radio station and Whalen lighting up a cigarette. Um, tell me what you know about Dripping Springs. Well, Dripping Springs, like you said, the first one was in 71 and it was supposed to be the country Woodstock. Um, but the promoters, they had to go out and find a space where they could set this up for this huge outdoor concert they thought they were going to be doing. And so it was on this farm and it was literally just dirt. So they set up a um, stage and a sound system and lighting, but it ended up costing so much because there were a lot of restrictions that the police put on these people. So they said, we don't want this to be like what happened at Woodstock. We want to be able to control it. We have to have police there. We want it to be civil. So the promoters ended up spending so much money on doing that, they ran out of money to promote it. So by the time it came around, that's why they thought they were going to be having like 20,000 people show up. Only 7,000 people showed up. And here they were literally with their lawn chairs on dirt. And the Rolling Stone critics said it looked like a natural disaster had happened and they just set up their lawn chairs on this whole bombed out piece of earth. So it didn't do well, they didn't make any money, but Willie Nelson enjoyed it so much and that he loved doing it because he had never really done live outdoor concerts before that, that he said, let's do it again. And so the following year in 1972, when they did it, it was successful and that really then became, they changed the name from Dripping Springs to Willie Nelson's 4th of July party. And then the rest is history and that's what happened. But what's interesting in these photos is you see Willie Nelson with short hair and clean shaven. And you also can see, um, you know, uh, I got, uh, I have, I have John Waylon, Klein up there. Waylon Jennings without, um, you know, without his beard or mustache, right. but you kind of see them transforming into this outlaw country kind of vibe that they were doing. And then uh, this photo here that I have up now is that's young Annie Leibovitz yeah. down below the stage with Waylon Jennings up on, up on the stage. And the shot before that's John Prine, right. uh, who of course we just lost sadly, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, and here's Annie again. And then uh, I'm going to flip through. So, so, you know, we've been showing you these blocks of artists, right? And, uh, we, you know, the Stones, the Dead, you know, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, Johnny Cash. Jim shot such a diverse amount of, of artists, genres. Um, he worked with everybody in so many different places. So I'm going to quickly, because it's already, you know, getting late. It's 3.30. We've been doing this for 90 minutes and we want to we want to save your afternoon a little bit here. So I'm going to flip through some of these quickly. So this is Country Joe McDonald at Woodstock, Muddy Waters at Newport Folk Festival, Muddy Waters backstage in San Francisco, um, Albert King backstage at Winterland, Sonny and Cher, Sammy Davis Jr., um, Duke Ellington and Quincy Jones, Buddy Guy at the Ann Arbor Blues Festival, uh, Simon and Garfunkel at Monterey Pop in 67, 
Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys at his house in 66. Um, Buffalo Springfield in, in, here in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Uh, the Birds shot down in Los Angeles. That's with, you know, Roger McGuinn on the left and David Crosby on the right. Um, this is Cream, of one of the most legendary portraits of them taken in Sausalito. Um, Eric Clapton uh, here playing with Cream. Everybody, this has been a bootleg photo forever that I've seen everywhere of Clapton and Jerry Garcia hanging out together. Uh, the Charlatans, one of the first psychedelic bands in San Francisco during the Haight-Ashbury times. Uh, the Charlatans playing a free concert in, in Golden Gate Park uh, Panhandle, you know, announcing the summer of love to the masses. Quicksilver Messenger Service. Uh, Otis Redding at Monterey Pop. Joni Mitchell in her house and Graham Nash's house where Graham wrote Our House. Um, uh, back in 70. Uh, legendary, iconic photo of Jim Marsh, of Jim Morrison of the Doors, taken by Jim Marshall. What's the story about this one, Amelia? Well, you know, Jim Morrison was kind of a weird guy, um, kind of not very out there. And Jim even didn't, you know, he didn't really get to know him very well, but Jim wanted to photograph Jim Morrison. So this was at the Pop Rock Folk Festival in 1968. And uh, Jim was following Jim Morrison around and finally Jim Morrison turned to him and he said, Jim, you want your fucking picture? Well, here's your fucking picture. And just put a cig the cigarette there and Jim clicked it and that the rest is history. There you go. Uh, Aretha Franklin. And isn't there a story about Jim working with Aretha? This is the portrait of her. Well, no, he photographed their live uh, their live album with uh, King Curtis and Ray Charles. Was that the, the Fillmore West or the Fillmore, one of those, right? Yeah, it was for the Fillmore. Uh, right. And Fillmore then West. Ray Charles again. And is this a New York City shot, the Ray Charles shot? No, this is San Francisco. This is 1960 at the Long Shoreman's Hall. Oh. So I don't realize Jim had a, a long friendship with Ray Charles as well. And so this is a really early picture of Ray Charles. And then uh, we have uh, Peter Frampton at the Oakland Stadium at one of the Day on the Greens. And of course, this is the cover of the Show Me the Picture book. Carol King on a park bench in New York City, uh, you know, back in the Brill Building days. This is a very young Jackson Brown in a recording studio making demo, demo tapes for, for Electra Records. Uh, and then we get to the Haight-Ashbury um, classic shot of the Haight-Ashbury sign right on the corner. Of course, this is where the Ben and Jerry's is today on Haight Street. And uh, so a number of years ago, um, Amelia and Benita realized that there really was a book on just the hate ashbury the bands, the fans, the people, the media. And so uh, Amelia and Benita brought over 3,000 rolls of film, proof sheets, to my studio, and I did a first edit. And I marked up proof sheets with post-it notes, and then they came back over to my house, and we sat here for, I think, a couple of days and we went back through the proof sheets and narrowed it down. And then we took hundreds and hundreds of images and we scanned them and they turned it into this book called The Hate. And, uh, and it's really a beautiful book. I'm pretty sure it's still in print and you can still it is, get yeah. it. Uh, but just, you know, Jim really documented what was going on on the streets. I love this color shot of this hippie dude and his girlfriend. Uh, Jim would do these long exposures with the strobe lights at the acid test or the Fillmore. And that's how you get these multiple frames. Uh, he has a very famous shot of Rosie McGee like this. She was Phil Lesh's girlfriend. That's not who this is. I don't think that's in the show. And of course, this is the cover of the book, The Hate, Love, Rock and Revolution, with the shot of the flatbed truck that the Grateful Dead were playing on on that uh, March 68 day. Um, and that brings us to the Jefferson Airplane. This is a photograph taken at the Monterey Jazz Festival the year before Monterey Pop Festival. And this is the original singer for the airplane, uh, Signe Anderson, who then left the band, of course, because she, she got pregnant and wanted to have a kid, moved to Oregon. And uh, Grace Slick, of course, took her place, came over from her band, The Great Society. And uh, here's an interesting fun fact. Uh, Signe Anderson, the original airplane vocalist, died the exact same day Paul Kantner from the airplane died, whenever that was, three, four, five years ago. Um, and this is the Jefferson Airplane in the Matrix, right? The Matrix was a little tiny nightclub uh, on Fillmore Street that was owned by Marty Balin's father. Marty was the singer, other, uh, one of the singers in the airplane. But you can see here's the airplane playing to a seated audience that has, I don't know, 60 people in there maybe, 
So this is really the birth of the Haight-Ashbury. Jim was out there, was there at the beginning before it became a media circus. And most people will say that, you know, the media will tell you uh, the summer of love was in 1967, but really the true summer of love was in 1966 before it got overrun by runaways from everywhere in the country and, and, and 2020 and Harry Reisner and, and Life Magazine and everything else that was going on. But Jim had a longstanding love affair with his camera, with Joan, by, uh, with Joan I'm sorry, with Grace Slick and the airplane. And, and I think out of all the rock bands in San Francisco, Jim photographed the airplane the most. Yeah. Uh, I think he did, Joan and the airplane were really the, the artists that he did, has the most roles of film on. Um, Amelia, any any comments on the yeah. airplane? Well, the air, airplane is, yeah, like you said, he was very close friends with them. And, and Grace Slick was almost like a female version of Jim. You know, she was like this tough, tough cookie. And I think that's why they, they got along. There were two peas in a pod. But he also just really, um, I think, connected with them. And so that's why we have such a diverse, huge archive of the Jefferson Airplane. And uh, what's really getting back to when you're talking about the Haight-Ashbury, it actually started in 65, right? At, that's the birth of it. And then it ended at 68. So people don't realize it was a very, very short period of time that all of this happened, which influenced the rest of the world. Also the counterculture, the fashion, the music, everything that was going on that Jim captured really just then resonated out, out to other parts of the world. And that's how, you know, you look back at the fashion, they just went to thrift stores and that's, they were getting their clothes from thrift stores. They weren't trying to make a fashion statement. I mean, they didn't have a lot of money. They couldn't afford to go and get stuff, but you know, it just resonated and made this mark in time. So by the time you see the Grateful Dead's concert in 68, that one where you see them uh, and, and the sea of people, that was their basically goodbye to San Francisco because it was already, it was just crazy. It was filled, it was drug induced and they had enough and they said, we're leaving, we're moving to Marin. So um, it's just interesting that people, I don't think realize that so, so much happened in such a short period right. of time. We have, a, we, we have a, a, a photo that I've never shown to anybody because I don't think it's appropriate, but there's a picture of um, Grace Slick with a canister of cocaine and a Coke spoon in it and getting ready to put it up to her nose. And like you said, her and Jim, you know, I'm sure that they uh, indulge in that situation over and over again. Right now, I'm on this very famous shot taken in Golden Gate Park of the band, uh, which became the cover of Volunteers. Uh, yeah. And they were filming some sort of promotional video. I've, I've had a hard time finding it on YouTube. I found it years ago, and then I didn't. But they wore all these crazy masks and these costumes, yeah. and they were rowing around in these rowboats in Stowe Lake and Golden Gate Park. And there's And Jim's got you know, five, 10, 15, 20 rolls of film from this particular day of them mm -hmm. hanging out and their manager was Bill Graham and Ron uh, and Bill Thompson. And um, uh, there's all this great images from that, but that's how they ended up with the volunteers cover, you know, Yorma and Jack. And then of course you get to Woodstock and here's the airplane on stage when Grace came out and introduced, I think they were supposed to go on at night, but came on in the morning and morning, said, yeah. you know, good morning and welcome to morning maniac music. Um, this is a, a famous shot of Bill Graham on stage with Grace and there's Jack Cassidy and um, uh, Sally Mann over on the left who was married to the drummer in the uh, airplane and uh, also would be considered a very famous Haight-Ashbury hippie, um, Sally Mann Romano. Uh, and then some of Jim's color stuff of the airplane. I love this portrait in the park with the light coming from behind the trees and then Jack hiding behind these beautiful red flowers with that hat and those glasses. And then, of course, there's this beautiful um, uh, portrait of Grace, which the with which Amelia was kind enough to let me use in a book that I published of mine called Hippie Chick, where Grace Slick wrote the, the forward for it. And we use this photo. The only photo in that book that's not mine is this one here of Grace. And it's just, you know, such a telling, intense photo. And you could really see that love affair that she had with Jim and Jim's camera. Um, love the shot of Yorma getting into a limousine in that velvet shirt. And, uh, you know, Yorma used to live, Yorma told me the story a few years ago, we all went to South by Southwest and did a panel on Jim and Amelia was on the panel. I was on the panel and Yorma was on the panel. 
And I told Yorma where I live in San Francisco. And he said, oh, I used to live a block away from there. And Yorma told me a funny story about how one day Jim came over about four in the morning and started yelling, Yorma, Yorma, I need some Coke. I need some Coke. And, you know, and, and he's like, pulls out a gun. He's like, I'll trade you my gun. I need some blow, you know. And Yorma's like, shut the fuck up, dude. This is a fucking neighborhood, you know. Like, what are you doing? You know, and that was like Jim's relationship with Yorma. Um, anyway, uh, Yorma and Jim had a long, long history together. Uh, Marty Ballin with a bunch of psychedelic posters in his flat. Uh, again, he, Amelia was talking about the fashion, like just this photograph, that jacket Jack is wearing and what Grace is wearing, and them standing in the tree in Golden Gate Park. And here's the airplane at Altamont. I, have, I, I missed putting this into the Altamont section, but of course the airplane was there as well. And that's a famous story where the Hells Angels were beating people in the audience. And you can sort of see a little bit of activity going down front and Marty Balin jumped down into the audience and the Hells Angels um, uh, beat him up. They beat Marty Balin up. And if you watch the film, Gimme Shelter, you can see that whole part of it where, you know, they're talking about angels, you know, hitting band members and beating up Marty Balin. Um, all right, that brings us to the who. Uh, Amelia, tell me about um, this portrait, which is of iconic, iconic. And again, one of the rare moments where Jim said, I need a posed photo of you guys. Yeah. Where was this taken? When was this taken? And why was this taken? And um, uh, this is tell me some of the magazines that Jim worked for at the time. Yeah, this was for uh, Teen Set magazine. Jim, uh, which is funny. I mean, you forget about these kind of magazines that were around then, but that's how um, you know people were introduced to the to the bands, and that's how they saw them. Were in Teen Set, Teen Beat, um, as well as album covers. That's really how people found out uh, what they look like. So this was the Who's first tour, first U.S. tour. Um, and this was 67, and this is before they went down to Monterey for Monterey Pop Festival. And it was outside of this um, motel. Do you, and I don't know if people know where the Phoenix is in the Tenderloin in San Francisco, but this was right there outside of what is now the Phoenix um, motel. But they look like complete babies. I mean, they just, if you look at the color one too, it's a totally different vibe. Again, Jim had, you know, these cameras, one with black, some with black and white and some with color. And what, um, what most people don't realize is that the Who really did not play in the United States that much. No. And so but Jim really hit almost every time they came to the Bay Area, starting with this one in 67 and, and going through the, you know, of course, Woodstock, which we'll see next here. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I look at this roll of film, right? So this is a roll of film and I don't know the backstory behind it, except for that it's a half a roll of film. The rest of the roll of film is blank. And so I look at this roll of film and I'm like, holy fucking shit, Jim's on stage with the fucking who at Woodstock and he shoots 18 frames and puts his camera away. Like, <laughs> but who knows? Like, you know, he could have been off doing something else. He could have been, he could have been like exhausted. It could have been the end of the set. I don't really know, but like, it boggles my mind when I see that proof sheet that's only a half a roll of film of the Who on stage at Woodstock. Well, you and know, when he fell asleep at Woodstock, he was so tired he missed Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, so I mean, was he was up for, wasn't Jim up for three days straight? Three days straight, he was so tired that he just couldn't stand, stand it anymore. Right, and Hendrix was, you know, and of course everything at Wood, Woodstock was so delayed by the time it got yeah. there. So I'm gonna move a little bit faster here. I love the shot of this backlit shot of the fringe and the shadow of Daltrey on stage at Woodstock. This is Townsend here back in San Francisco doing a big, big leap. Uh, I believe that this is the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium. Yeah. And uh, I love this shot because look, there's no, there's no photo pit. There's no separation between audience and band, right? The band is, the audience is on the stage, which is also why Jim shot from on stage for so many artists, because back then there were no photo pits, there were no bar barriers, barricades, right? So Jim was, you know, if he was backstage hanging out with a band like this shot here of Keith Moon or this portrait of Pete Townsend or Pete warming up in a dressing room, by the time he came out front, there were so many people in front of the stage, he couldn't get in front of the stage. So he was forced to shoot from on stage. And of course he had all access. So that's what he did. Let's move on to Santana here. Um, Jim had a long, long relationship with Carlos, still goes on to this day. Carlos loves Jim. Carlos contacts us frequently about things that he would like to use. You know, obviously it was the, the 50th anniversary of Woodstock last year. And so Amelia gave Carlos some photos to use in his slideshow on stage and things like that. And uh, 
of course, Carlos is inspired by Miles and Coltrane. And so he owns some artwork that he got from Jim when he was alive. Carlos and Jim had a really tight relationship, but this is them in the recording studio when, when Santana was making their first record when nobody even heard of Santana yet. And this is a very legendary series of photographs here. Um, the sequence of Carlos recording and making these incredible faces. And then of course you get to Woodstock and the cameras are in front of his face. Um, has, did Jim ever tell you his side of the story about shooting Carlos at Woodstock? Cause I've heard from, I've heard Carlos talk about it. I'm just curious if there's a Jim story. Well, from my understanding, I mean, Carlos was on really on some a big acid trip. And so he thought that his guitar was a snake. So he thought that he was wrestling this snake and Jim was there photographing. That's, he was on stage. And if you watch uh, Woodstock, the movie that from that time, you can see Jim bopping in and out yeah. backstage with the cameras around his neck, photographing everything. Yeah, but, um, and that, and that's a true story about the snake. Um, I, I have had the pleasure to photograph Carlos a number of times and I shot his big supernatural record. And when we were having lunch, he told me the whole story about uh, taking the big dose, I think it was mescaline, actually not acid, mm -hmm. and that you know he was super high, and his guitar was like a rubber, you know, rubber, and felt like a snake in his hands. And and then here's that photograph that you were talking about earlier. And yes, mm -hmm. Santana is on stage. It's the RN shot. I can see Greg Raleigh on keyboards there. So I know there's another version where they're warming up. It's just before they go on, but this is the one where Jim climbed up on the scaffolding because the Grateful Dead had dosed him, and he was completely fucking out of his mind. And uh, and uh, it's just such a weird thing because it's got the turntable stage there that's getting ready to spin. And there's all these people. It's just so hard to tell, like, is there a band on stage or is it just a bunch of people moving about? Right. But, um, that is the famous photo. And Carlos does have a big giant print of it hanging up in his uh, in his office. Um, I've seen it there. Um, and then uh, Hendrix. Um, tell me about James Marshall. Hendrix, James Marshall, Jim Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. Tell me the Marshall, the, the Marshall trilo trilogy. The trilogy. Well, Jim photographed when, I don't know which one you're going through now, are you? Uh, so this is the one for Backstage at Winterland, but let's get to, and then this is all Winterland. And then uh, now we're at Monterey Pop on the drums. Yeah, well, the one, the next one after the drums at Monterey Pop, um, Jimmy was rehearsing. This was actually sound check. And what happened was all the photographers were gonna go have dinner. And so they left and Jim stayed back. And they said, hey, Jim, you wanna cut? And he goes, no, no, I think I'll stay back. I just, you know, wanna be here. And he had a feeling something was gonna happen. And then he started, you know, Jimmy started fucking around on the drums and then he picked up his guitar and he just hit this note that he loved and just boom. And Jim captured that. And everybody, it really looks like it's a live performance, but it's not. This was just sound check at Monterey Pop. Um, and when Jim talked to Jimmy to introduce himself, he said, hi, I'm Jim Marshall. And he goes, hey man, this is supposed, this must be this, this is supposed to happen. And Jim goes, what do you mean? And he goes, you know, it was supposed to happen. Jim goes, uh, no. And he said, well, there's three Jimmys on stage right now. He said, there's Jim Marshall, Jim Hendrix, and Marshall Amp, Jim Marshall Amps. So he goes, it must, it was just meant to be. Because Hendrix's middle name is Marshall. So Marshall. James, James Marshall, Marshall Hendrix, yeah. uh, Jimmy, Jim Marshall, and then Marshall Amps. Yeah. So yeah, very, very cool. Um, yeah. And uh, and yeah, and like you were saying, this is sound check because you know Hendrix's actual set was at night because he burned the guitar, which of course is right here which is a very, very famous shot. And, and when he first started burning the guitar, Marshall was on stage because there's a few pictures of him from the side of the stage. And he must have ran like a motherfucker <laughs> to get in front of that stage because you know he, he saw that thing go up and he knew that the shot was in front of the stage. And you also have to remember that the stage at Monterey Pop was like 12 feet high or nine feet yeah. high. And so he had something that he climbed up on. There was no fucking stopping Jim Marshall from getting this photograph. And he climbed up and of course, you know, this is one of the most iconic. But also Jimi Hendrix had um, warned him, he said, I hope you have a lot of film in your cameras, Jim. And Jim goes, yeah, I do. And that's because Jimi Hendrix knew he was gonna light his guitar on fire. And then the next uh, couple of days later, Jimi Hendrix did a free concert in, in the Panhandle in Golden Gate Park. Yeah. Uh, and there's a whole story about the equipment that the Grateful Dead crew stole from the Mamas and Papas to do this free concert, but we don't have time to tell it. Um, <laughs> here's Led Zeppelin. I'm just going to zip through some of this stuff because we're getting pretty late here, uh, yeah. getting close to the two hour mark. And I want to get some questions in. We've got Harrison 
uh, who's leading the interns um, uh, and getting questions. So Jimmy Page, I love this portrait. I have this hanging on my office wall. You just don't see Jimmy Page with this beard that much. And of course, right. Robert Plant, these guys are babies. I mean, look at them. And, 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 and then of course, you know, there's this band portrait, then he's hanging out in the limousine. This is Jim Marshall in the limousine with the golden gods of rock and roll, Led Zeppelin, you know, yeah. cruising around LA. And then, you know, Janis Joplin, Jim, another, another artist that Jim had a really, really special relationship with. He did a lot of stuff with Janis and Big Brother. Um, you know, you go backstage and you get Janis laughing and happy. And a second later, you know, her mood changes and then she's frowning. And of course, you, you know, here's Janis doing a free concert in the Panhandle in Golden Gate Park and just looking right at Jim. They had this special connection they, that, you know, she was not afraid of Jim. She knew who Jim was. You know, there, it, it was really, really special. This is down at that Newport, um, uh, at the San Jose Folk Festival, uh, where he did a shot of Jim Morrison. That's where this shot of Janice is from. And then of course he did these portraits where he had like a, a, a seamless red backdrop and it's just a skylight. There's no lighting, it's just a skylight coming in. And then of course there's the legendary photograph of Janice and Grace together. The only photographer to do this photograph. And this was Amelia 14 set magazine. Yeah, this magazine? was for, no team, team beat. Team beat. Magazine. Think about that for a second. <laughs> Janice and Grace in teen beat magazine. Like these were the cool magazines in 1967. This is what the kids were listening to or, or reading rather. The Grateful Dead were being written about all these bands. And these are the assignments that Jim was getting, right? I'm a working photojournalist and I did a million assignments for all these different magazines as well. Tower Pulse and Request and Rolling Stone and Musician. But Jim was shooting for teen magazines and these were the artists. This picture of Grace and Janice together is so iconic and so beautiful. I mean, it's mind blowing with Grace wearing the Girl Scout shirt. And, um, you know, he shot it in, in, in two and a quarter, which is rare for Jim, which is a larger format. You know, the negative is two and a quarter inches square, which is this shot versus the previous one, which is 35 millimeter, which is what Jim was known for shooting with his Leicas. Um, and then, of course, here's Janice with the Southern Comfort bottle. This is an iconic photograph, one of the most well-known photographs of Janice Joplin backstage at Winterland. And then here's the vertical version. And then Jim said, this is, oh, we always say this is the unhappy version. Yeah. Um, uh, and then Janice on the Porsche down at the Palace of Fine Arts here in San Francisco. This photograph here is a very, very famous photograph and it's called the Five Bands. And Jim put this whole thing together. Um, it all started up on the front steps of 710 Ashbury. You can go on YouTube and see a little video where Jim's walking across the street and all these artists are following him. And so from left to right, you have Quicksilver Messenger Service, The Grateful Dead, and then you have the airplane and Big Brother with Janice kind of mixed together. And then you have the charlatans over on the right and it's called The Five Bands, taken in the panhandle right down the street from 710 Ashbury. And it's just a beautiful, incredible photograph. And there's Jack Cassidy from the airplane holding the red, white, and blue striped hat that was actually Garcia's, uh, but Jack is holding it. And it's just one of those super iconic photos that Jim Marshall took. Um, here's a portrait that I took of Jim with the Bob Dylan photo at a gallery opening in San Francisco. This is Jim with Ramblin' Jack Elliott that I took with uh, Jim's portrait of Ramblin' Jack behind him. Uh, Neil Young came to the show. That's Neil's daughter right behind him, Amber. And of course, this is Jim giving me the finger. This is a portrait that I did. I mean, I was a fan, he was a mentor. I asked him if he would come to my studio one day if I could do a portrait of him. And he came down to my studio in San Francisco, South of Market, and I, and I did this portrait of Jim. And so um, that is the presentation. Um, Harrison, uh, again, it's, it's 10, to, 10 to four on the East Coast, 10 to one here. Um, we've been going for just about two hours. Let's get some questions. But before we do questions, Amelia, anything you want to wrap up with about Jim? Because I kind of hijacked it there at the end a little bit to get through this. That's okay. No, um, it's just what I what I hope people will take away from this is Jim, you know, people either loved Jim or hated him. He was not an easy person to get along with, but what he was was a genius of a photographer. And I want people to come away with this with a new understanding of how Jim photographed and it wasn't just music because he got stuck in this kind of stereotype of just a music photographer. He was a photojournalist who documented pieces of the history that will never happen again. And um, I just think we're really fortunate to have this body of work that he's left 
you know, left for the world. And especially today with what we're experiencing right now with what's going on, Jim photographed a lot of that 50 years ago. So I think it's very important to look back at it from today's point of view, but also learn from it and carry it into the future of what we do in the future from now. So, you know, um, Show Me the Picture book really encompasses all of this. So I encourage you, if you really enjoyed, you know, the slideshow and you enjoy it, you wanna learn more about Jim or you already know who Jim is, please get the book because it really is a history of Jim Marshall and who he was and how he developed and how important of a photographer he is in today's time and age. And, and, I, please, and I, I also want to say that we're really fortunate that we have you to shepherd this all out into the world because a lot of big archives like this end up in university archives and they end up in file cabinets and nobody ever sees it. And, and Amelia and Benita, her partner in this endeavor, have done everything they can to learn about the history and connect the dots and, and connect the dots of that history that is so important to our lives, pop culture, American history, and all through the lens of Jim Marshall and, and not be afraid to, to show all the sides of Jim. You know, as Amelia, when she first started today, you know, she came right out and said, Jim was a drug addict, Jim was a coke fiend. And we know that, and, and that's part of who his personality was. You know, we're not, she's not glossing over who he was, but what she's doing is making the world aware of how brilliant Jim was and that, and that she's not afraid to tell the truth about that, but also dig, dig, dig deep and not just do this as a passing hobby, but make this her full-time mission to find this work and to find these hidden gems that people have never seen and bring them to the world so that we can all see them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And and Jim also, you know, Jim was my friend. And so I made a promise to Jim. I knew that he was going to leave me his archive. Um, and I made a promise to him that I would care for his children when he was gone. And that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm treating these as if they're my children that I need to nurture and keep going for another generation. So when I'm gone, they're still around that people can, you know, look at and and learn from. So um, thank you, Jay. That that means a lot what you said. Because, Absolutely, it's so yeah. important, and I mean it. I we work together. We talk to each other all the time. I mean, I know what you're doing. You know. All right, Harrison, you got some questions for Amelia. Absolutely. So the first question comes from Danny Clinch, and Danny would. Would like to know, he says, Jim was obviously a major player when it comes to social justice photography. Do you think Jim would be out and about shooting now with what's going on today? I think, um, I think Jim, it's interesting because he was older, you know, he's would be 82 now. <laughs> so he does, he loved social justice. He loved shining a light on the underdog. But I'm just not sure if he would have gone out today. I think he he uh, would have loved to have seen what was going on, but I'm not so sure that he would be up to going out. But I know he would have supported everything that's happening, and um, because it's important. Like we said, this is something that happened in the past that we're looking back at 50 years now, and seeing what transformed. And uh, photography is such an important vehicle to show that and to, you know, to show something without even talking about it, it can speak, a photograph can speak. So I think Jim would have definitely uh, been very into what was going on and encouraging younger photographers to go out and do that and use, you know, the camera as a tool. I'm just not so sure if he physically would have gone out there because of his eight, being 82. And I, I also don't think, you know, Jim died 10 years ago. Digital cameras were very prevalent 10 years ago. And uh, Jim didn't shoot anything digital. You know, no. Jim's, Jim's archive is 100% film. And uh, it's not so easy to shoot film these days. You know, there aren't the labs that there were to develop your film. It's, it's not as easy. I mean, there are film labs, but, um, you know, Jim, Jim, Jim didn't shoot a lot even later in his life. He'd shoot here and there. He'd bring his camera. He'd take a picture of you if you're hanging out. But Jim really wasn't out shooting a lot at the end of his life. Well, the reason, and the, the reason for that as well is because music photography in particular had really changed. And, you know, the managers and the handlers had put a lot of restrictions on people. And he just didn't want to deal with that. When he went to photograph, he wanted all access and he wanted to be able to do what he did without anybody telling him how to do it. 
So, you know, later in life, he was not photographing as much. He was really just going through his archive and, and um, you know, kind of seeing what he had, had um, basically documented over the All years. All right, Harrison, you got another question for us? Yeah. So Lori B would like to know if you can speculate on what may have happened to those 17 rolls of lost film from Altamont. Have any of those photos resurfaced? No, none of the, and that's interesting. No, they've never resurfaced. So um, they truly are lost. Who knows what happened? Maybe they, you know, got thrown in the trash and they're in the landfill, um, but they have never resurfaced. So they're gone. Interesting. So the next question comes from Matthew and he wants to know how did Jim make the transition from taking pictures of normal everyday people to taking pictures of you know, some of the greatest musicians of the last 100 years? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, again, because Jim loved documenting history and what was happening around the in his environment when he was doing it. So when he came back to San Francisco from New York in 65, he was really there at the epicenter of the counterculture movement and rock and roll and what was happening. So because he was there, he, and he became friends with a lot of these musicians and he gained their trust. And then he became known as the photographer. If you wanted to get a really great photograph of yourself, you wanted Jim Marshall. So it really came out of him befriending these people, hanging out with them, gaining their trust and taking just amazing photographs that were not set up that really showed the person and who they were. But again, um, they still look like his photojournalism because they're not set up, they're not in a studio. And so I think that's what sets Jim's photography apart as well is because it's very real and it's in that moment and it reflects what was happening as well. So um, he took all of that and brought it into his music photography. But if you look at the music photography, if you look at the proof sheets, you'll see them performing. Let's say Jimi Hendrix was performing at a live concert in the Panhandle. Well, a lot of the ph photographers, when the music stopped, would put their cameras away and walk away, but Jim didn't. He then took the camera and photographed the crowds and then the neighborhood and the people and the peace signs and everything else that was going on. So um, I kind of really think that all of this was very natural for Jim. He was a photojournalist that used his camera to tell stories and show what was happening at that moment. So I think we have time for a couple more, right, Jay? Yeah, yeah we get you three more. Great. So what have been some of the most surprising finds among Jim's unreleased photo archive and approximately how many photos exist in the entire archive? And that question <laughs> is from Doug. <laughs> That's a, you know, we're still discovering more. I mean, it's really what's, what's been interesting for us is it is like an archeological dig in the sense that we are going and finding these treasures that we never knew existed. So um, we get surprised every day, actually, when we find things, tons of stuff. Um, there are over a million photographs just in black and white 35 millimeter alone, because Jim, this was his life and he shot you know, for 50 years straight. And his, his true love was his photography. Um, and so he has such a vast, massive archive that we are still going through now. So um, we discover things, but tomorrow we may discover something else that we never knew existed. So I can't really, you know, say one uh, particular image is a favorite one or something that we've, because we're just, it's ongoing. It's happening all the time. And also his, his black and white is, is fairly organized. He, keep, he kept track of everything in sequence by roll number. Right. Um, unfortunately, Jim did not keep track of specific dates on a lot of stuff, almost everything, almost anything. And so we would do a lot of sleuthing. So we would say, okay, rolls number 4,300 through 4,350 is the Monterey Pop Festival. And we knew that was right. June of 67. So we could look at something that was 10 rolls after that. And we knew that it was the next week, or we know Woodstock was roll number 5,000, whatever. So we could interpolate a lot of things and of course the internet helps you find stuff so you you know we know if it's albert uh, albert king and Jimi hendrix playing we know it was winterland on this date right so 
um, you know, we can find specific dates. And because he numbered all of his rolls of film in sequence, it is in chronological order, with the exception of a handful of things. He would do a job, send it off to New York, get it back three months later and number it into the system then, and it would be off by a little bit, but we could figure it out, right? So, and then with Jim's color, it was a little bit more disorganized. So with his color photographs, it never, he, he left a lot of stuff in boxes. He never took it out and put it in slide pages. That's how I do my archive. And so there's, we still discover color stuff on a regular basis. One of my favorite discoveries was that photograph of Bob Weir that we showed earlier with the, with the face makeup on because I'm a big deadhead and I have a lot of interest in that. And so when I discovered that, and there was another photo I found of Janis Joplin where she was just hanging out on Haight Street, sitting on a curb, talking to some people. And there was just one frame of her. Jim was literally walking by. She was hanging out with some people. He took one picture and kept going. And, you know, it wasn't marked on a Janis Joplin. It was, on a, it was when we were doing the hate book because it was the hate Ashbury and I was looking through all those proof sheets. So um, I think they're like Amelia said, there's still things to be discovered because there's what, 20,000 proof sheets or something like that. Yeah, it, yeah there's so much, but, but one of the things that has surprised me that I do love seeing is Jim loved photographing children. And you would never think that if you knew Jim, um, but in a lot of his early street photography from 19, the 60s, early 60s in San Francisco and New York, you see these little um, black children playing in the street and Jim photographed them. So again, he just was gravitate, he gravitated towards innocence and, you know, humanity and these things that um, took place. And, and so for me, it's kind of refreshing to find these little kids playing very much like Helen Levitt would have documented in the streets of New York, um, because it shows that softer side of Jim. All right, two more questions. So uh, this question is coming from Janet and Janet says, you mentioned Jim's feelings on shooting and hanging out with the Grateful Dead. Did Jim have a favorite artist to shoot overall? A favorite artist? Other than, the, you know, I mean, not separate from the Grateful Dead? Well, you, you had mentioned he didn't particularly love hanging out and shooting the Grateful Dead. Right. right, right. Yeah, who, was, who, was, who was one of James, Jim's favorite artists to work with? Well, one of his as, is Joan Baez. I mean, you look at, we have a stack of proof sheets that is, I don't know if you can see like this much. And he loved photographing Joan because she was human, but she also had a great sense of humor. And so uh, she loved to just talk the shit with Jim and pull practical jokes on Jim and, uh, and get him. But that was interesting because when we did the peace book, Joan Baez did write the afterword for the peace book. And uh, for her, she said, it was so interesting because here was this guy who she knew as this gun toting, you know, conservative kind of person who found a fascination with the peace sign and the peace symbol and what it stood for. And so she really loved that part of Jim being able to connect to that part of Jim. So I think um, a lot of the women musicians Jim gravitated towards. He, he loved Janis Joplin because she was so real and she let Jim take her in whatever studio. You know, she said, baby, this is just me. Go ahead, take whatever you want. So um, I think those were kind of the, the closest ones that I know was Joan Baez and Janis Joplin. He had a very, very good relationship with both of those women. I think there's over 400 rolls of film of Joan Baez. Joan Baez um, yeah. And you know, it's funny, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Herbie Green on the program and, and uh, Herbie was telling me about a fashion shoot that he did down at Monterey Jazz with Marty Balin from the airplane. And I found a photograph that Jim took yeah. of Herbie photographing that scene and Herbie's got this hippie headband on and he's dressed in hippie clothes when Jim was at Monterey Pop in 1967 the height of the summer of love and everybody was dressed in full-on psychedelia Jim wore a brown corduroy jacket khaki pants a button-down shirt and looked like a fucking nerd yeah. right like so Jim was like Amelia saying like how this sort of conservative side to him right but it was this like drug-fueled you know like old school Dean Moriarty, Neil Cassidy kind of guy, right? Amongst all of these hippies. Is that correct, Amelia? Yeah, yeah, he was. And actually some of those photographs are in jazz festival too. We have those of Herbie photographing right. <laughs> Jefferson Airplane. All right, one more question, Harrison, and we'll wrap it up. 
All right. So the last question is from Morgan. And this one is more of a personal question for you. Um, what has it felt like for you to take over the estate and become responsible for continuing to propel Jim's story and messages through his photography? I know you mentioned how Jim would refer to his photographs in the archive as his children. And you know, how has that impacted your life and your story? Um, profoundly. It really has impacted me profoundly because I, like I said, I just, I made a promise to my friend that I would care for his children. And so basically that is my life is Jim Marshall and it's Jim Marshall 24 seven. And for me, it's extremely rewarding because we will find, he just, it, it amazes me in going through the archive, finding all of these different kinds of photographs and subjects that Jim documented. And um, it's so important, especially today. I mean, I, I've, we've been posting on Instagram with the, the protests that have been happening, Black Lives Matter. Well, in 1968, there was a protest against police violence. So Jim documented that in 1968. And it's just going through and finding that history does repeat itself. And Jim has, and finding that Jim has documented all of that. And it's, it can be very overwhelming, but at the same time, it's extremely important to share with the world and, and to encourage and cultivate younger photographers and to let them know that this is something that's very important and that you can do it. Because I know a lot of younger photographers get frustrated with what's happening and feel uh, helpless. And for me, it's being able to share Jim's work and what Jim photographed historically, share it with these younger photographers so they can maybe um, be inspired and, and be inspired to go out there and document history and show it as it's happening so that future generations can see it. So for me, um, it's really rewarding. It's overwhelming, but I love doing it. And it's, and Jim is with me every day. So. And she keeps digging like, you know, when, like, you know when, when Jim was alive, I think I saw a handful of photos that were not music of Jim's. I saw the clown smoking the cigarette, like, you know, maybe three, four, five images. And since Amelia has taken over the estate, now we've seen hundreds and hundreds of these photographs from Mississippi and New York City and the streets and all these things. And so, you know, like she's saying, she's having these profound experiences bringing this stuff into the world and we're all benefiting from it. All right, so Amelia, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your stories and this work. Um, it's so important to our, our, our history of our country and pop culture history. Um, my program here is called Photos with Stories. Uh, July 12th is our next one. We're going to be talking about the photography of Neil Casal. Uh, just check thefans.com, check my Instagram, my Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. We will keep you posted. Um, and uh, thank you for watching. I know these are long programs, but I think they're a lot of great information. Like I wouldn't want to give Amelia 30 minutes to talk about Jim's work because we could talk about this probably for another four hours and really drive you all crazy. And, and there's that, that much photography out there in this archive. I mean, I think we've scanned close to 10,000 images of his archive since I've been working in it, which is an enormous amount of images to have scanned of one person's work. And there's probably 10,000 to go. Um, yeah. you know, and that just scratches the surface, but that lets us see a lot of, the, of what Jim would do. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you, Benita. I know you're not on the screen. Benita is <laughs> Amelia's partner and who I talk to, the three of us all the time about all the things going on that we do with Jim Marshall's estate. So I wanna thank Benita for helping out on the program today and uh, in the background. And um, <laughs> thanks, Amelia. And um, we will talk soon. Uh, there's a new Bob Dylan box set that just came out that Jim has, I think, 10 or 15 photos in or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a new um, ja, um, uh, a Monk CD coming out, vinyl yes. record, I think in the next month or two. It's been getting some press here in NPR and whatnot. And I believe we have three photos on that package that Jim took of Monk at the Monterey Jazz Festival. So Jim's yes. photographs are continually being used to uh, um, share with what happened 50, 60 years ago. Thanks everybody for watching Photos Thank with you. Stories. We'll see you in a couple of weeks on July 12th. Thank you, Amelia. I really appreciate your Thank time. You. Thanks Harrison and Will for teching this out and the rest of Harrison's crew under him. Um, we'll see you all later. 
Have a good have a good Sunday and uh, peace be with you. All right, cheers. Goodbye. Bye.